some of the other sessions are running the break. So we'll see. Yes, they do. Uh, so you guys have time cards? Yeah. It's gonna be, because it's going to be live. So if we just <laughs> we go back it. from so like 435, you know, five minutes. I got two more days. I was going to be... Yeah, I did have to. 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 It's going to be very sexy and neutral in, in what I have to say. Yeah, I mean, the process is still ongoing, right? So I don't know. Yeah, because they don't want to listen to us. Hello? Does this one work? Working? Working? No? Yeah. Um, I can kind of hear it. I can hear it somewhere. I'm just going to sit up here. I think it's one of those. That was fun. I mean, that's I like, that's that's us. Like, so those comments are not addressed. Yeah. So I think that's fun. I must try to friend and robot. Yeah, well, very slow. And back. that's fine. So you can go ahead. Oh, it's not here. Is it? Yeah. Do you know my room? Yeah. Oh, is he around? Okay. Yeah, I think this one's working. And there's my room. Right. Is he cool with that? I'm cool with that. Oh, so he's coming then. I get it. Okay. But then you have to come over. I mean, you have to come over. Yeah, you have to be doing okay. Yeah, I'm there. Okay. It's kind of crazy. Did you see the previous talk? No, I wasn't. Okay. No, so I mean, before. No, 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 no. No, he's not. Yeah. I think he is. Yeah, but he's around. Okay, let me encourage us all to sit down because Glenn's going to give his talk starting five minutes ago. So the longer we stand up and keep talking, we will not be able to hear this awesome book launch. Um, this session will end probably at 4.50 because at 5 o'clock, the keynote session will be starting across the hall. In Grossman Hall, the whole big thing. And so this session will go until then. And I will turn it over to you, Glenn, to introduce yourself and the book. It's all for me. All right. Thanks so much, Sean. And uh, thanks for having me. It's a really wonderful conference. This is my first time at the Global Congress. So I'm really proud to be here. I'm really proud that I finally got my book written, got it published. It's copyrighted. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, but that's the way these things go. It's called Copyrights Excess. Uh, and let me start by telling you what it's not about. It's not about the fact that we may have too much copyright. It's not that we protect too much under copyright or that we protect it too broadly or that we protect it for far too long. That would be the problem of excess copyright. What I mean by copyrights excess is that copyright, the incentives it provides are fundamentally misdirected. We're supposed to be trying to encourage the production of additional works at the margins, where we fear we'll get too little in the absence of copyright protection. But that's not really where the primary incentives copyright provides. They, provide, they fall mainly to the non-marginal works we would get even in the absence of copyright or no copyright at all. So to explain that a little more thoroughly, which is the point of my talk today, um, uh, let me start at the beginning. And we all know how that goes, and God said, let there be light. I that's not quite what I'm going to start with. So our old copying competitor story, in the absence of copyright, when you write and publish a book, someone's going to copy it or file share it today. And so you're not going to get everybody who wants a copy to buy a copy. Some of them are going to get them for free. And because I have a PhD in economics, and yes, there's a story there, but we'll tell that another day. Uh, we can do this all, there's the book, we can do this all graphically by showing some basic supply and demand model. And so we have our actual demand curve, which is hyphenated or dashed here, downward sloping, as you would expect. And of course, it's dashed because it's not the actual curve that the producer or the author observes in the marketplace. Because some of those people who actually want a copy of the book are getting a copy by copying a friend's copy or through file sharing or some other mechanism. So there's a gap between the actual demand curve and the paying demand curve. And so the paying demand curve, to the extent the author and the publisher respond only to paying demand, is what the author or publisher is going to look at deciding whether or not to produce a given work of authorship. Instead of uh, our production rising to level Q, where actual demand intersects the supply curve, it only rises to Q prime. 
And so this is what we talk about in copyright is we're going to get too few. It's not that we're going to get none at all, but we're going to get too few works of authorship. This is the underproduction, the suboptimality in economic terms. And so the idea of copyright is to prohibit that copying. And if it were effective, we could push that demand curve all the way out, the pain demand curve, all the way out to the actual demand curve and bring our production level in the economy up from the Q prime, which is too low, to the optimal level of Q. So when we think about it in those terms, we get a clear benefit from copyright, and that's the additional works of authorship that are written and published uh, that we would not receive in the absence of copyright. These are what I mean by the marginal works. These are the works that become profitable only because we create copyright or because we expand copyright. And so these are the works that are a real public benefit that copyright gives us. In contrast, under these assumptions, we also have a bunch of non-marginal works. Those works that would be produced in the absence of copyright, or with narrower copyright, if you will. And these are the works to the left of Q prime that we're going to get even in the absence of copyright. We're going to get some production even without copyright. Uh, and so we don't really need copyright to bring those forth. We don't need that additional incentive. They're already expected to be profitable under the existing market structure without copyright. And so copyright is unnecessary. Nonetheless, with a copyright system, it's uniform. All these works, if they're original and they're fixed and they're works of authorship, are going to receive copyright's prohibition on unauthorized copying. And so for all of them, it pushes the pain demand curve without copyright uh, so the pain demand curve with copyright all the way up to the actual demand curve. And so this is what I mean by copyright's excess. These are additional works, non-marginal works, that are getting additional money from copyright that's really unnecessary, that has no public benefit. It's not giving us additional works. It's just additional compensation to the author, the copyright owner, or the publisher, whoever that may be, however that's divided up. And so that's the problem of copyright's excess. And it's received very little attention in the literature. Our usual analysis of it from an economic perspective is it's just a wealth transfer from copyright consumers to copyright owners. And wealth transfers in economics are largely uninteresting. They have no efficiency consequences. Um, and so the question is, is that really true? Um, and of course, in the graph here, you can see that the cross-hatched excess area larger than our little bitty triangle, but this is just a hypothetical. But of course, if we look at the real world markets for copyrighted works, demand is highly skewed. So this is the top 1,001 songs on Spotify in 2014 worldwide, based upon their number of streams, that were on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and first appeared either uh, before 2006. So we have our top work of those works that was streamed almost 60 million times. Uh, you guys know what that is? Want to guess? Uh, from 2005 and before, that would be Eminem's Lose Yourself. And then it goes all the way down here to the 1,001 work, which is streamed slightly less than 5 million times in 2014 worldwide. That's the Google Dolls name. And so if we think of the problem here, this problem of excess incentives, and we think of the Goo Goo Dolls work as our marginal work, and we try to give them one more dollar through a uniform expansion of copyright, whether through term or scope or royalty rate, and we're going to increase the earnings of all of these works, these non-marginal works, proportionally. And so to give one dollar to the Goo Goo Dolls, we have to give over two thousand dollars to the non-marginal works. And so this makes it very difficult for copyright to target its real point, which is to encourage the creation of the marginal works. And of course, this is not as bad as it gets. That $2,000 number, that's not the extent of copyright's misdirective incentives. The average work on Spotify is not streamed 5 million times like the Goo Goo Dolls uh, work was in 2014, but 15,000 times a year. Uh, the top work is not Eminem's Lose Yourself at just under 60 million. It's Drake's one dance at over a billion streams in under a year. So to give one dollar to that marginal work at 15,000 streams a year, we have to give $66,666.67 to Drake and the other copyright owners of one dance. Because you're increasing all those earnings proportionally, and I'm sure it's just a coincidence that that happens to be the number of the beast. Um, and so 66,000. Okay.
So in our traditional approach, we're balancing incentives versus access. Um, and so we're worried about the dead weight losses that occur from overcompensating these, uh, this excess copyrights excess. And so our underlying assumption in copyright is always that more incentives lead to more and better original works. This is, uh, assumption's never really been thoroughly tested. Seems perfectly plausible though, maybe entirely sensible as well, but for more than 300 years, we've expanded copyright ever broader on the assumption that this premise, this assumption is true. And so in this paper, right, I'm gonna try and test it. And as Mark Twain liked to say, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And so what we know for sure in copyright is that if we give authors, copyright owners more money, we're gonna get more and better works of authorship. That's what we think we know for sure. And so I wanna test that premise. And so the first thing we have to do is sort of express it in a formal economic terms so that we can test it. So more money, more music. And so I'm gonna use the recording industry as my test, uh, my natural experiment in this area for a simple reason, and that's because of file sharing. So all of these, of course, have been sued out of existence. Napster, the symbol on the upper left corner, has been resurrected as a lame sort of authorized streaming site. Um, nothing like its original really cool uh, file sharing, P2P. This down here is, in case you've never seen file sharing screen, you've never used it, of course, I know. You may have had some friends who did, but you yourself personally never used it. Uh, and so this is the LimeWire uh, sort of interface. And so it just allows you to share music with anybody else who has the same uh, file sharing program if they sort of click the right box or don't click the right box. Every bit of music on their computer is available to every other member of the file sharing program. Now, you know the copyright owners sued all these out of existence. They went after file shares, individual file shares. They went after the ISPs trying to get them to adopt three strikes, a graduated response, all in an effort to shut down copyright. And they won a lot of those battles. And as you know, they were very successful in putting file sharing tools to bed. No longer exists. Well, okay, maybe they didn't win the war, won the battles, lost the war. This is uh, Cisco's Visual Networking Index Estimate of File Sharing Traffic in North America in petabytes per month. And so you can see we're over here in 2016, about 1,000 petabytes a month. How much is 1,000 petabytes a month? That's about, if you converted it with all music, an album length, 800 megabytes worth of music, 1.25 billion albums a month or 250 million CDs, uh, DVD quality sort of of movies, depending on what it is you're copying. Okay, so uh, in the traditional incentives access paradigm, there's something good about file sharing, right? It gives us much broader access to music. So if all that file sharing is of music, and it's not, we'll talk about that in a minute, but if it were, right, the little red line over here on the bottom is the authorized sales of musical albums in the United States. And it peaked in 1999-2000, right over a billion albums per year. If all that file sharing traffic were music and we converted it into albums, you can see that while the authorized music sales have gone down, um, the music people are getting from file sharing has gone radically up. Now, of course, it's not all music. We've got to get our porn somewhere, I suppose. And so file sharing seems to be a popular, popular spot for that. Um, but up today in 2018, the Cisco's estimate is 1,600 petabytes per month. So that's 2 billion or 24 billion uh, albums a year of music. So even if it's only 5% of that, it's still over a billion albums a year uh, of music. 24 billion, 5% uh, of that would be just over a billion albums. And so this is why I testified before Congress that file sharing has put more music in the hands of more Americans any invention since the phonograph. Now, I know what you're thinking to yourself. I don't file share, so what good has file sharing done me? Well, file sharing not only sort of gives direct substitution, direct access to a copy of a song or an album, it also placed considerable competitive pressure on the music industry. And so they had to agree to things that they wouldn't have otherwise agreed to, like allow Apple iTunes to sell individual downloads of singles rather than just sell the entire album, which had been their model there to Ford. 
And so you can see here that even if you've never file shared, if you've downloaded a single song from iTunes or any of the other sources, Amazon.com, you're the beneficiary of uh, file sharing. Because Apple was able to go to the music industry in 2004 when iTunes was being set up and said, if, if you don't agree to break the album and let us sell individual singles at a price that will compete with file sharing, we're not doing it. And so sales of singles took off. And so they went from essentially, you know, right, the industry hated singles. There was not much profit margin or revenue there, up to one, just under 1.4 billion singles um, in, by 2012, I think that date was. And so a lot of that downward sale that we saw in the lost revenue is actually because people started buying singles, the three songs they wanted from an, uh, an album for 99 cents instead of paying 17 or 18 dollars for the album as a whole. And so even if you've never file shared, right, you get the beneficiary of file sharing if you've downloaded individual singles, if you listen to Spotify or some other streaming service, they were able to negotiate license terms, again, against the backdrop of the competitive pressure from file sharing. So that's the good of file sharing in the incentives access paradigm, more access. The bad, of course, is less incentives. And so you can see here, uh, the fall in revenue in constant 2013 dollars from just over 20 billion dollars at the peak in 1999 down to below 7 billion dollars. We got a little recovery here at the end, but of course when you publish a book you've been writing it for three years and so you don't always have the most recent data in the book. So I don't have the last couple of years in the book as it were. So that's a dramatic fall and so one question is, right, we're trying more money, more music, less money, less music. Is that really true? Well, a superficial test we could do. How many albums, this is the sound scan count of albums released in the U.S. annually. And you can see back here in the peak revenue errors before file sharing of the late 90s, it's about 35,000 albums released annually in the U.S. We rise up in 2008 to over 100,000 albums, and then with the Great Recession, we tail off, and today... It's about 75,000 albums a year. So less money, more music. But of course, I and others, Walt Fogel and Hanke, have looked at this sort of recent period. So in the book, I wanted to do something a little more challenging. I wanted to look at music output in the U.S. for the whole rock era since 1962. And so I went back and got the U.S. record sale, again, converted into constant dollar terms, so the discounts for inflation. Uh, all the way back to 1961, and so this is where it starts. We get the sound recording copyright created in 71. We get this bump up here in 78, then we get the era of oil embargo, second one in the recessions. We get the tail off uh, as the economy goes bad to 82, 83, about $9 billion U.S. sales then. And then we rise steadily to our $20 billion peak in 1999, and then with the file sharing, we drop up. So we're testing copyright's premise that more incentives should give us more and better music, because that's the industry we're focused on. Um, and this should be an easy test for copyright to pass, right? We're not looking at very small changes in revenue, 10%, 5% here and there. We're looking at going from under $5 billion, right, at $4 billion, up to 20 right? And so all of us, when I ask you this question, should immediately raise our hands. We paid them all this money in the 90s, how many of you think that the 90s are the best music era decade for popular music in the U.S.? Okay, so I guess the premise is not true. We can also put this in terms of the wealth transfer. So if you start back in 71 when we created the sound recording and assume that sales would increase at the pace of inflation, and because it's a constant dollars, that means stay flat. You can look at how much additional wealth was transferred to the music industries record labels and the artists through the creation of the sound recording copyright. And again, the point here is not to be technically accurate, an exact measure of that wealth transfer. It's really just to give some sense that there's a very large wealth transfer. And so um, the amount of the wealth transfer works out to be $117.6 billion, again, constant dollars, $2,013, which is comparable to the Apollo moon landings in the Marshall Plan, uh, so what we want to see here is something comparable to landing 12 men on the moon or rebuilding Europe after World War II, right? We want to see a dramatic increase in music output, quantity and quality, because we're paying them a ton of money. Uh, and so that's the real test here that we're going to undertake. So 
What measures of music output do we have that extend over this entire 50 some odd year period? Well, one is the Billboard Hot 100 chart, most popular 100 songs each week, 100 slots, 52 weeks a year, so 5,200 songs can make the list. Now, it turns out if you count the number of unique songs, non-repeating songs, new songs on, that make the list each year, almost all the songs on the list are repeat. We get nowhere near 5,200 new songs each year. The most we ever got was in 1967 when we got 743 new songs on the list. It then sort of steadily declined to 2002, where we got just under 300 new songs on the list. And then it sort of rebounds before tailing off at the, uh, with the Great Recession. And so when you think about this, these are the songs that are good enough to make the Hot 100 list. Um, now, there's a complication and wrinkle there that I cover in the book about whether a relative performance list where you get a top 100 is really a good count. Uh, but it turns out that it works fine in the music space for reasons I'll get into in just a minute. And so this is a good indication that really our peak music years were the 60s and then in the post-file sharing 2005 and thereafter. That's the exact opposite of the way the revenue chart went, right? Revenue went up and then came down and our sort of peak output on the Billboard Hot 100 chart started high, goes low, and then comes back up when the revenue starts. Okay, but that's one measure. Do we have anything else? Well, Rolling Stone magazine put out a list of the top 500 greatest albums of all time. And if we sort those albums by the year of their release, this is the chart we get. Uh, and so it peaks here after the British invasion in 1970 with the Led Zeppelin albums, and then it begins a sort of steady decline. Now, it's Rolling Stone magazine. You've got to be a little careful. Just a bunch of old white guys. What do they know about music? Not that much. Um, but it does coincide quite sharply uh, with what we saw in the Billboard Hot 100 yet list, though the peak is a little bit off, and they don't sort of start saying this Taylor Swift stuff we're getting in 2006 is wonderful. Somehow the Rolling Stone magazine execs are not in love with Taylor Swift. I can't imagine why. Um, really, they should just not. <coughs> haters going to hate. You know what they say. Uh, okay. <coughs> so this is not great evidence, but some evidence that tends to confirm uh, the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Some of the best evidence that I happen to find, right, and we actually could find a lot more of this if we could just get some people to release it, is the 2014 play count for the top 1,001 songs worldwide on Spotify. So again, these are the songs released from 2005 and before that made the Billboard Hot 100 chart when they first came out. And so uh, on the earlier slide where we showed Eminem, Lose Yourself Down to the Goo Goo Dolls, we just had all those songs individually. Here what I've done is I've grouped those songs by the year of their release. And so Eminem songs appear from 1999 when he started and thereafter. Um, the Goo Goo Dolls are in their time period and so on. And this is the total stream count for each year. I can actually do, in the book I do, total stream count, total song count, and then average stream count for each year. Uh, and they all exhibit some of, this, oops, some of this time trend where more recent songs are more popular. It's probably because we like newer music better. We still prefer to listen to it today. It's also probably because Spotify's population, its user base, skews young in age distribution. So, but we can take that time curve out uh, through regression analysis and normalize the age-adjusted play counts. So this is sort of relative to what we expect, the zero line here. How is a given year relative to our sort of age-adjusted expectation? So you can see here that our peak revenue periods don't do well at all. Right? They do terribly. And in the book, I go through a series of regression analysis that look at that issue specifically, and they either find no correlation before, uh, with more revenue between music and revenue, or a negative correlation, that more revenue meant less or um, fewer or lower quality hits. Uh, so we have a few good years here in the 70s. We also get this sharp uptick. Uh, in the low revenue file sharing era, we get an uptick in 82, 83, which, if you'll recall, was the low revenue uh, oil, Arab oil embargo recession. And so it doesn't seem to suggest any support, provide any support for copyright's fundamental premise. Okay, so let's go back to Billboard's charts. So these are the unique song count, again, from 742, I think it was, 
down to 294 and then creeping back up into the high 400s. We can break that down into two categories. One is new songs by new artists. And so this is the new artist count each year. And you can see it's generally trending downward. Um, and then we can sort of look at, if you look at it sideways right here in the 90s, it looks like there might be a slight flattening out. We can get a better sense for whether that was uh, an improvement in new artists on the Billboard Hot 100 chart by converting it to a percentage of new songs. And there does seem to be a period here in the 90s where we get some additional new artists rushing in. So it may be that the additional revenue is helping us with uh, sort of new artist introduction. But we have to be really careful here because this is not an absolute count. It's a relative count, percentage of the new songs by new artists. And so it has to sum with one. And so we know from here that really new artists are decreasing throughout the time period. Uh, the reason that the new artist percentage goes up is that the existing artists are contributing fewer and fewer songs. As revenue is going up, they're having fewer and fewer hits. So this is falling more sharply than the new artists. And so you get that bump in the percentage because these are falling relatively more sharply. And we get the rise in new songs in the post-file sharing area, primarily not because of new artists, right? They continue to fall, but because our existing artists are producing more hits. And so the question is, why is this going on? Why are we getting more hits by our existing artists uh, during low, uh, low revenue periods and fewer hits by existing artists during high revenue periods? And so the hypothesis I test or propose in the book is this excess that we're vastly overpaying our most popular artists. And so Justin Bieber earns so much that he can announce his retirement at 19. Seems to be a little bit of a working retirement. Garth Brooks announced his retirement at 39, though he came back after his daughters were older. I never understood that retirement. He's like, I want to spend some time at home with my teenage daughters. <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's the time to go on the road. They're teenage girls. It's going to be bad. Um, so we have some evidence of this sort of um, overpaying the superstars, they're earning so much and they're sort of not working quite as hard as a result. Speaking of that, right, I'm from Houston, so of course I'm glad about this because it meant that Michael Jordan earned so much that he could go see if he, he wanted to go see if he could hit a curveball. Turns out he couldn't. Took him two years to figure that out, so the Rockets got in there and won two titles while he was off trying to hit a curveball. Uh, and so the theoretical concern here is known as the backward bending labor supply curve. Here's an illustration. So if I say to you I'm going to pay $10 a week, how many hours is that week going to work? Okay, we don't know at all. It depends on the individual. But here I'm saying maybe you'll work 20. What if I say 100 hours a week? Going to work more hours per week or less? Most people probably would say more, though I have some friends who would say, i got plenty. got gas for my tank and my boat. I'm going fishing. Um, what if I pay you $1,000 an hour? Well, you're going to work really damn hard. Okay, what if I pay you $10,000 an hour? Or $100,000 an hour? Or a million dollars an hour? Man, if you pay me a million dollars an hour, I'm working three hours and I'm done. <laughs> all right, that's all. And that's for the whole year. That's not per week. Um, and so this is the notion, right? At some point, we have enough money, and so we're not interested in getting more money, though everybody's different on this. Um, and I'd rather spend my time and my money on the things I enjoy, like fishing, if that's your thing. Right. Now, we already know that the wages uh, top superstars can earn, like Justin Bieber, are up here most likely on the backward bending labor supply curve. The blurred lines trial, uh, Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams and T.I. showed that they earned something like $17 million in profit for one day of work. That's a pretty good wage. And you could see where that might be enough to say, okay, I can sort of like winning the lottery. And so the question I always ask my students, let's say you're Justin Bieber and you got $20, $200 million in the bank and you got everybody loves you. You can go out and do anything you want. You can go anywhere you want. Are you going to work tomorrow? And they all say no, right? And most of these superstars are fairly young and I think that's the answer we're getting. So can we prove that, right? So I tried to prove that in a couple of ways in the book. So this is our top recording artists, the top 250 best-selling artists of all time, according to the Recording Industry Association of America. And this is the number, the scatter plot of when they released their first album and how many studio albums they released in the first 10 years of their career. So in the early 60s, 
these artists were releasing on average 14 albums in the first 10 years. So more than one per calendar year. Drops to 8.5 in the late 60s, then to 7 in the 70s, and then to under 5 in the 80s and 90s. So we're paying you more money. Technology is advancing, making it easier to do recordings, and you're giving us fewer albums as a result. And so if this is really causal, what does it suggest? Well, the Beatles, Beatles released their first album in 63 when the average was 14 albums for these best-selling acts. And they released 12 plus an extended play. So they were almost there, right? Um, but if they had come out in the 80s or the 90s and had earned more in those higher revenue periods for each album they released, um, maybe they would have only matched the output of the bands during those eras, the same sort of best-selling bands. And so then they would have only released five albums, if that's the way we go. And what would we have lost culturally? Well, we would have lost all of their last half of their albums. We would have lost Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club, the White Album, Abbey Road, and Let It Be. They would have broken up much sooner uh, than they actually did because they would have had the money uh, that they would have needed to feel comfortable saying, okay, we're done. I can't stand Ringo anymore. He's just a little odd looking. We can also look at not only at albums released, but at the number of hits over the first 10 years of their career. So I've got an asterisk up here to remind me to tell you something here. You've got to be careful. This is the way I did the study. I looked at artists from 1962 to 2006, first 10 calendar years of their career. This is the hit count where you're the principal or lead artist, not when you're a featured artist, not when you make an appearance on someone else's song, not over your entire career, just over your first 10 years. Does not include Elvis because it's 62 to 2006. So if you go look online and say, well, this is not the Hot 100 top appearances, it's because we're counting them in different ways, but I'm trying to do productivity. And so I'm saying the measure of work I have is being the principal elite artist on a Hot 100 hit, and I'm doing it over a period of time, 10 calendar years after your first hit. And so these are the top seven, I think it is. Taylor Swift at the top with 66 Hot 100 hits. You know, she just squeezed in a few more breakups for us. She probably could have had a few more there. Um, the Beatles had 64, and then we get Marvin Gaye, the Beach Boys, Miley Cyrus, Neil Diamond, and Dionne Warwick. So I've also given the year of their, not their album release, but their first Hot 100 hit. So what do you notice about those years right off? Our peak revenue periods are the 90s. Our second best periods are sort of the 70s and 80s, and then the post-file sharing era of 2006 in the early 60s were our worst revenue period. So why are all our top hit producers from the low revenue period? To get someone from a top revenue period, say the 90s, you have to go all the way down here to number 20, and tied at number 20, you find Jay-Z, who had 28 Hot 100 hits in the first 10 years of his career. And incidentally, if we go back here, you see this little dot sticking way up in the sort of late 90s, that's Jay-Z. He had 10 albums, 10 studio albums in the first 10 years of his career. Um, and so it looks like more is going on here than just coincidence. It does appear to be that the more we're paying these people, uh, the less they're producing. Again, because of the skewed revenue. 90% is going to the top 10% of the artists. We're trying to help the marginal artists, but they're not getting any of the additional incentive. When the revenues really spike in the 90s, Almost all of that's going to our top artists. And incidentally, uh, sort of the peak revenue period in terms of 10-year industry averages, 93 and 94, our top Hot 100 artists in terms of number of hits in the first 10 years of the career were Tim McGraw and Shania Twain. Well, I have to like quite a bit, but uh, not quite the same as these people on this list. Okay, so then uh, in addition to that, I also do regression analysis. This, the dark spots are the top artists for each year. The gray spots are the second best artists. I did it for the top 10 best artists for each year, and then regressing it against the industry cumulative average over the first 10 years of that career with a one-year lag. And even if we leave, so here's the Beatles and here's Taylor Swift, even if we leave them out of the regression analysis, there's still a downward slope statistically significant to the curve. The more you pay the top artists, the less they work, because they have enough money at some point to say, I'm ready to retire. Justin Bieber hit that point at 19, 
even though he was in sort of the low revenue post file sharing period. Uh, and incidentally, although I only go up to 2006, um, the number one group in terms of Hot 100 hits in the first 10 years of their career is from 2009. Anybody want to guess who that is? It's the Glee cast. They have 209 Hot 100 singles, and it was in much less than 10 years because they've already broken up. Um, okay, so this suggests a real problem with our notion of incentives because our notion is more money, more music. And yet what we find is more money did not yield more and better music. We may have gotten a few more new artists at the margins, um, but we got a lot fewer hits from our existing artists, our top artists. And as a factual matter, the second effect outweighed the first. So we got a net reduction in music output in terms of the Hot 100 hits and the, the music people like to listen to reflected by the Spotify data as well. So what to do? I've got three proposals in the book. Do nothing get some reform, abolish the sound recording copyright. This is my slide for do nothing. Notice the copyright notice. <laughs> if you copy it, send me a royalty check. So do nothing means just keep the current equilibrium. We're lucky, right? File sharing came along. File sharing itself may not be great. We may not like it, but put a lot of competitive pressure on the music industry. So they agreed to start selling singles digitally. They agreed to start streaming their music, which if they had not gotten file sharing there as a competitive pressure, I can tell you they never would have agreed to. Uh, so we gotta try and keep that in place. That may mean we have to do something because Congress occasionally gets a wild hair and does something unexpected and unwise. So it may mean we need to keep Congress from doing anything, but that's a lot easier than making them do something. In terms of reform, really what we need to do is try and reduce these excess incentives to the superstars so they'll work a little harder. And we need to increase the incentives to the marginal artists. And in the book, I walk through a couple of ways we can use the existing uh, unusual features of music to accomplish that. So I pro propose using the uh, performance royalty organizations, the PRO, Public Performance Royalty Organizations, and so ASCAP, BMI, Sound Exchange. Instead of giving all their money out on the basis of popularity alone, where most of the money is going to the most popular songs, you could set aside 10, 20, 30, 50 percent for a livable wage. For anyone who achieves a certain level of popularity in the music, that would achieve both in, uh, of our goals. You could also look at two tier royalties through Section 115, the mechanical license, digital downloads, nine cents per copy for the first 100,000 phono record deliveries one cent per copy thereafter. Uh, or we could abolish it. Now my good friend Pam Samuelson reminded me that politics is the art of the possible, so why am I even talking about the impossible? Uh, Pam, my only response to that, it may not be a good one, is that we define what's possible by the impossibles we accept. So that's my uh, book. I'd be happy to answer some questions. But I think this is sort of the start of something. It's tended to be the start of something. We relied on stories in copyright and patent about what the incentives will do for us. But now we're starting to enter an era where we can test that. And sure, I only had Billboard and Spotify data, but ASCAP, BMI, and SoundExchange, they have all the data. And we should start making them when they come in and ask for a rate increase, show us who this money is going to. Show us which works are still earning the money after 20 years. Show us that the money is giving us more and better works rather than just encouraging people at the very top uh, to buy an extra vacation home to spend their time in. So I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, I think we have a few minutes left. Josh. <laughs> yes, actually in the book, that's one of the mechanisms I do suggest. You could have a windfall profit tax on the superstar artists or superstar authors and use that as a sort of substitute to generate a subsidy system for um, the marginal works of the marginal artists. Yes? Um, yeah, so it's terrific because I shared um, sort of all the data and the, the normative thing is sort of intuitive and what we could do. I guess, I don't know if you addressed in the book, but some people might argue that it's worth one marginal album to give up 10 Justin Bieber albums Yeah, so when I uh, 
I, I, I've given this lecture a number of times in different audiences, and uh, so Sarah Rajic uh, from William and Mary was the first to suggest that. Well, it's a good thing the, I forget which boy band it was from the 90s that broke up. She said, what about the social welfare benefit of them breaking up so we didn't have to listen to their crap anymore? Um, <laughs> uh, and so there's a certain amount of truth to that, um, but you know, uh, what I'm trying to do with the Spotify data in particular um, is look at music that seems to give people pleasure, and they're telling me it gives them pleasure because they're listening to it. And if they like it, whether it's Eminem or NSYNC or Justin Bieber, then as an economist, it's not my place to say, well, you're a sick individual, and we ought to uh, address that issue very seriously through therapy, maybe some regression analysis of a different type. Yes, Matt. Well, I address some what I call pseudo-economic justifications for copyright in chapter two of the book. And uh, there are three of them, and one of them is this promoting jobs argument. And so the argument is if we give more revenue to the copyright music sector, then they can hire more people. Um, but this is Bastiat's broken window fallacy. Where did the more money come from? Do you just got a big invisible pot of more money you can hand out? No, it meant that consumers had to pay more for the music in one way or another. And because they had to pay more for the music, that means they couldn't have paid more for food or books or anything else, dresses they might want. And so whatever money you're giving the copyright industry for broader copyright or stronger copyright, it's just coming from the consumer and out of some other industry. So all you're really doing is shifting the jobs from that other industries that would have gotten that money but for it having to go for copyrighted works to the copyright sector. Now, congressmen may be fine with that, or congresspeople, um, because then they have jobs they can claim for credit for, rather than other jobs they can't claim for credit for. But it doesn't increase employment uh, for the economy as a whole. Right? So that's sort of a net zero gain. You just take jobs from here and put them there. And the easiest way to see this is, let's say that you've got a choice between um, a sector of the economy, music, that puts out great music every year, but only employs 100 people, and uh, a music sector that puts out only crappy and not much music each year, but employs a thousand people. Which one of those two music industries do you want? I want the first. I want the great music, even if it employs fewer people. Yes. Right, so my proposal with the PRO for the livable wage is expressly that they would take money they would otherwise give the most popular artists and give it to the marginal or average artist. Um, and there are other proposals, the windfall profit tax would do the same thing. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, I assume that it's proportional, the earnings are proportional, that if I have 10 million streams and you have 1 million, I earn 10 times what you do, but they're actually, as you say, more than proportional because you can negotiate your deal with Spotify individually and to get Taylor Swift to give you, please, 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 her albums on Spotify, you have to pay more per stream than you do for the marginal artists. So that's definitely right with the existing system. I'm not sure if I answered your question. We can take it up. Yes. Okay. 
So that's a sort of a complicated question to answer all at once. So let me start with the first part, which is, does this apply immediately to the European situation? In the book, I'm very careful to say no. Like, there's a study of one industry in one country. Um, its lessons may apply more broadly, but I certainly wouldn't extend them generally. Even within the U.S., I wouldn't say this is also what happens in books or movies or computer programs. Right? It's just to start the discussion and show the type of studies we need. And maybe those other sectors here in the U.S. would be completely different. They're not driven by the superstars getting 90% of the revenue, the top 10% getting 90%. They're driven by a much more um, equal distribution curve. And so in Europe, even in the music sector, it may well be different. I would, you would have to study that. And of course, the collecting societies know the answer to that question. Right? They know who they give money to, and they know who's getting 90% and who's getting the pennies on the dollar. Um, as for the sort of value gap, there's only so much you can do to help stupid. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm not sure what they're thinking there, that they're going to suddenly get Google to start paying 40 euros for 4 million streams instead of 4 euros. You know, I, I really have no idea what they think they're going to accomplish through that. Uh, and certainly part of that debate is Google's an American company. And so if we can tax them to take the money for... Um, uh, European artists, that's a win, even if it's just a very small amount, even if it reduces the size of the pie for everyone. Um, but it's a very complicated question, and so those are just some short answers, some initial thoughts. But I'd ha be happy to explore it more with you. But ideally, what we should do is studies of this sort for Europe and see how much difference, right? Now, we have Articles 11 and 13. How much difference in 10 years do they make? For the average artist in Europe, for the top artists in Europe, who's getting, is there more money being paid and who's receiving it? And what is society getting in return? Uh, so in the U.S., we're very much a focus on consequentialism. It's really for more and better works. I realize there's a natural rights component, and so compensating the author fairly, the artist fairly, is a big part of the European mission on its own. I think we're out of time, Jerry. So you guys... Uh, we'll take it up afterwards, but I was informed very strictly that I have to keep to the rules because everybody has to go to the keynote, listen to Pam and all the other very gifted speakers on that panel. So thank you. So I think it's a little different now, because I think in the recording industry in particular, right, the individual artist actually gets a big share of money. So it's a little different. Right? A corporation can always hire more researchers if the ones they've got become lazy. Or go to startups and try to build from there. What I was thinking about, too, is whether your book had any references to intrinsic motivations. You're premising it all completely on this theory that we have, which is extrinsic or motivated by money. Yeah. I just have a couple of throwaway lines, yeah. right? If, and I do say in there that it may be that you know, cultural production does not respond to the imperatives of the market. Yeah. So music production is not a function. Right. Now, I would note that if that were the case, we wouldn't see any patterns in any correlations between revenue and music well, output. Yeah, so I don't think it's quite like one or the other. No. But and so I would say in that regard, I think because we find a correlation, though it's the opposite correlation you expect, money matters. It may not be all that. I think that's definitely right. And then after a certain level of wealth, it matters Okay. Yes. So it becomes counterproductive. Yeah. Hey, Jerry, sorry I didn't get to your question. Well, I don't know how it is now, but I used to know the Italian. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
I think it's I think it's Jamie's bag, I would guess. Uh, sh sure, we can just, yeah, let's switch the screen, yeah. Okay, welcome. We're going to get started with our keynote forum. Are you having a good Congress? Are you having a great Congress? <laughs> no, it's supposed to get louder the second time. Okay. Uh, so starting off with a uh, just a couple announcements and keep us going. Um, so tonight, so I think you've all discovered that we hide the really good food, right? If you've been eating sandwiches all Congress, it's because you had not discovered the fact that we hide the really good food. Um, and tonight, after today, after, the, after this session, after this keynote forum, we're gonna have a reception. The whole reception will be upstairs and we have hidden all the good food. <laughs> so there is an Indian food station, there is a Latin food station, and there is some other food station that I'm even gonna keep that aspect hidden. And so if you haven't found all three, then you have not experienced the reception. We have also hidden a band. That will be easier to find. <laughs> and we have not hidden the bars. There'll be a ton of them, and they'll be all outside. Um, three cheers for good weather. All right, hip, hip, hooray. OK. <laughs> so today, we will have the reception outside. We have also hidden a, um, a photographic exhibition, and I won't tell you where that is either. So find the photographic exhibition at the reception. Um, after the reception, we will have a dance party. And as I can't remember who it was that asked me, are we trying to compete with the Rio Global Congress? And the answer is yes. We think we have a cooler club that you will enjoy even more. And we've reserved the third floor of the 18th Street Lounge between 9.30 and 11 p.m. And it's a cash bar, but we have to spend $900 or I personally will have to pay the difference. <laughs> so because you like me, please show up and buy a couple drinks before 11, because <laughs> it's literally my personal credit card on file. <laughs> Um, and a couple things about the 18th Street Lounge you need to know. First of all, you will not get in without an ID, and that includes like, you know, Jerry Reichman and Peter Yazzie and Pam Samuelson, and ID, everyone has to have an ID. That's the first one. The second is you have to have the address because there's no sign on the door. So if you're walking into a club that has a sign on the door, there'll probably be a lot of Global Congress people inside, but it won't be the 18th Street Lounge. Okay, so there's two traps on either side. So it's a door with a bouncer, and it's an open door with a bouncer and a staircase, but there's no sign. So the address in the agenda is the correct address. Go to exactly that spot. Uh, and finally, Polis. Uh, where's Joe? Joe, you want to say a couple words about where we are with Polis? Thanks, John. So by now you've received at least a half dozen emails about participating in the Polis conversation. Uh, hopefully you've heard this in panels and workshops. About 150 of you have listened and have participated. Uh, that leaves another 150 or so who haven't. Let me strongly encourage you to do that, uh, to spend 15 minutes, 20 minutes uh, working through the Polis questions. These are all statements that have been submitted by your colleagues here. And it's getting into some very interesting territory around uh, issues that both uh, you know, join the different aspects of this community and also divide it. And we'll be able to talk a bit more about that tomorrow at the closing plenary. But I would like that to be as full a presentation of the perspectives of this community as we can. And then we'll let it run a few days after the end of the Congress too, so that you can go home and you know, if you just don't have time to engage with it now, you can engage with it later. We'll then turn that into a report that could be circulated in the community. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, so um, lots of measurements of success of the Congress already, but I wanted to just um, share my favorite, which is I've been um, first just kind of trying to attend almost everything for like five minutes, and they've all been awesome, and every time I've entered a room, I've gotten a little nugget of information that I went away with. But um, I've also been asking everyone, I've, I think I've asked like 30 people today, what was your favorite session or talk? And this is a true fact, not a single repeat. Everybody has told me a different session or talk that they found to be their favorite. So I think that's awesome. This isn't just like one good panel surrounded by a bunch of crud. It's been, it's been all good stuff all day long. So thank you very much. And we have a whole nother day of this tomorrow that will be a little more workshoppy. So tomorrow we're gonna move into more workshops. There are some kind of presentations, but there'll be a lot more deliberation. And we kind of designed it that way purposefully to have a lot of kind of big, exciting, big ideas and information dumps, and then some more kind of micro sessions focusing on particular strategies, et cetera. And then tomorrow afternoon will be our final global assembly. And this is the moment where you can influence what's on the agenda. So each of the tracks will report back what they think they've accomplished. Some of the tracks are trying to accomplish some specific things. The, uh, the user rights track will announce our uh, publication of a draft civil society uh, treaty on, on education and research, for instance, and other of the tracks are working on different things. And there'll be um, time for you, uh, the, for all of us as a community, to kind of discuss about our priorities and to celebrate a little bit more and to thank us all and then go on our merry way. There'll be a small reception after tomorrow, but you're very free to make your dinner reservations with your best friends all around town. So with that, let me invite um, up our first panel. So the way this is gonna run is we're gonna start with a discussion and then we're gonna have a presentation, a talk by Pam Samuelson on justifying the public interest in intellectual property and then another discussion after that, kind of responding and especially thinking about the access to knowledge field and, and debates between open strategies and limitations and exception strategies, et cetera. And then we'll go into our party. So let me um, invite up, and now I have to wake up my computer. But we have, um, so Michael Geist, uh, law professor, Law professor at the University of Ottawa, who holds the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce and is a member of the Center for Law, Technology, and Society. And Michael Geist is known um, extremely well to all of us for his, for his advocacy, for his research, and for his role as a public intellectual in trade debates, and especially trade debates following intellectual property around the world. Um, Amy Kapsinski, so Amy Kapsinski is a professor at Yale Law School, and I feel like I should just put a period after that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. But there's actually a bunch of other amazing things in her resume, including she clerked for Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Stephen Breyer on the U.S. Supreme Court, and she founded Universities Allied to Essential Medicines. Uh, Rob Wiseman, Rob Wiseman, El Presidente, President of Public Citizen, which is the premier consumer rights organization really globally now. I mean, Public Citizen, especially under Rob's leadership, has shifted from US-based advocacy into much more international advocacy at the same time. He founded the Access to Medicines Project at Essential Action where he was the director and was my first employer in this space. So Rob was my boss and, um, and he's also the, uh, and there's the, the Essential Medicines Project is now um, located at Public Citizen as well. And Peter Maberduke is one of the planners of our Access to Medicines track and is here somewhere. Peter Maberduke is actually out setting up the band, so he's gonna be playing tonight, literally. <laughs> and James Love, so James, the Director of Knowledge Ecology International, he was previously Director of Consumer Project on Technology, which the big secret is, is more or less the same thing. Uh, Rob and Jamie really, you know, together were the ones that, that brought me into this um, space and the, the list of, of uh, projects and declarations from the A2K Treaty to the, the beginning of the access to medicine movements through some of these um, meetings of academics and advocates um, has really been part of, of the way he's worked for so long and has brought so many of us together um, both strategically and in the physical space. Um, and finally Marumo, Marumo Nakomo. So Marumo is the legal director for international trade and investment at the South African Department of Trade and Industry. 
but he is himself also was a professor at UCT. So he gives us the experience of someone who came out of academia and was doing um, some of the policy work at the IP unit, for instance, and then went into government. And now has really, we can see through his work, striving to bring research to bear on some of the policy questions that are going on in South Africa. And in particular, around a report that, that he and uh, Andrew Renz and Achal is here, um, published in South Africa, kind of making the evidence-based case for progressive um, patent reform uh, within South Africa. And so we're going to, I'm going to sit down with the team here. And um, the, the session, this part of the session, is focused on what can we learn? What can we learn from these different projects in our past that tell us something, that give us some lessons about what we can, what we should achieve going forward into the future. So we've, I've asked each of the panelists to just reflect a little bit of that and to basically start off the conversation in any way they want, any kind of response to that. And even though Amy asked to go last, I'm just going to take them in order and pass the mic down because it's a little easiest. So Amy, you're on the spot. You have the first three minutes prep. No, first, first Michael. You're going to be second. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that was confusing. Um, <laughs> so if I, I want to start by saying that this is simply my favorite event that on the calendar it only ha doesn't happen every year, but when it does, uh, it's always a thrill to, to be here and to be a part of it. Um, we knew that this was going to be the question, and I must admit I was going to start with, um, in terms of a lesson learned, one that was, was, can be a bit discouraging, but also uh, invigorating in terms of the, the, the need to continually evolve and change, and that was the lesson that there is no magic secret sauce or magic recipe, that every time um, we have some successes and we think, okay, now it's the opportunity to try to replicate that, truth it doesn't work as well. We talk often about innovation and the value of innovation, and the truth is we need to keep innovating all the time as well. But that's not what I'm going to spend my last couple of minutes on. Uh, that changed when I saw, and I'm sure a lot of you happened to see it uh, earlier today, where two incredibly courageous women uh, confronted Senator Jeff Flake at the, uh, just before he was going into, the just, into his justice meeting uh, and may have really turned the tide at least for a week uh, in term, terms of changing uh, Flake's mind where he started by saying he was going to support Kavanaugh and now uh, has successfully at least ensured there's going to be an FBI investigation and a one-week delay. Um, I thought it was an, it's, a, it's, it's, a, a, it's a really uh, amazing uh, achievement. Uh, and it reminded me that more than thinking about campaigns, when I think about the different kinds of success stories and activities, uh, it's really the, the accomplishments at times of individuals who have had the courage to take on uh, things that seem too big and influence in ways that one previously think wasn't possible. And so to give you a Canadian example dating now, it's about 10 years ago, um, we had some success in delaying the introduction of uh, what was going to be a really bad copyright bill. And so we had a conservative government at the time. They were all set to introduce the bill. I don't even remember the bill C something. I don't even remember the, the number anymore. Um, but the minister at the time was someone by the name of Jim Prentice. Uh, who had been brought in to run that particular minister ministry at the time by, by the prime minister at the time, Stephen Harper, and he was viewed within the government as kind of the person that could get things done. He was getting things done on wireless spectrum. He was getting things done on a number of areas, and he was brought in to put this copyright issue to bed at a time when um, the user rights community was just beginning to emerge as a as a notable voice in Canada, and. The time Facebook was relatively in its, its relatively early days, and we started to see people gravitate online around Facebook and really s begin to speak out. And people often talk about that Facebook group as one of the reasons why the government actually, in what was almost unprecedented, delayed the legislation for many, many months. It ultimately went nowhere at all, and they came back with legislation that, for those that follow Canadian copyright law, you'll know, uh, is viewed as one that does a far better job of trying to strike uh, a balance and contains within it any number of uh, user rights provisions. But the story that I think is far less well known, and we've got a bunch of Canadians who are involved in that, who may or may not know this story, um, but the, the, the kind of the build up to uh, 
sort of the Facebook group and activities taking place had started to get some attention. And Jim Prentice, this minister, was a Calgary-based uh, member of parliament, went back for the weekend. It was early December. And he went back and he hosted a constituency event where people could go and, and visit him as part of a holiday party. And about two days before that, I got an email from someone by the name of Kempton Lamb, a random person who lived in Calgary, who I suspect few, if any of you, have ever heard of, who said, I see what's taking place, and I see that Prentice is going to be there. What can I do? And Lamb spent his time trying to find people to show up to Jim Prentice's office on a Saturday afternoon and tell the minister they were unhappy with what they understood this legislation was going to contain. Lamb was able to get dozens of people to show up. I think 50 or 60 people showed up in a room much, much smaller than this. I mean, it literally was just his constituency office, so it's just an office. And I'm reliably told that Prentice, who had seen certainly some of the social media activities and some of the concerns, was suddenly confronted in the same way that Flake was con confronted with people face to face who were saying they were concerned. This wasn't just an abstract policy anymore. This was people who were saying, we don't want to see this happen, and we matter. We're in your riding, and we, we are speaking out on this. And as I understand it, Prentice flew back to Ottawa on the Sunday, and on the Monday morning, word went out that they were going to delay this legislation um, because he had seen something that he hadn't previously seen before. Now, there are, I think, as part of all of our stories, many of these kinds of stories where it's not the big campaigns necessarily or the big names, it's the individuals who take this to heart, take the kinds of issues that everyone in this room cares about and find a way to make a difference. And I think we saw it earlier today uh, in a really powerful way with respect to Flake, but I think we've seen it in other instances amongst many of the kinds of issues that we get engaged with. Thanks. Um, so, you know, those women were, from what I can tell from Twitter, connected to the group that's been doing these protests all week, actually the last, during the whole nominations. This relates to the topic. And, and, that, and that's because the people who have been central to all the organizing around the, the confirmation hearing are people who grew up in the AIDS activist movement, right? Jen Flynn may be a name known to you guys. Paul Davis may be a name known to you guys. Those two have been absolutely central to bringing that kind of protest to Washington, D.C., first to save health care, now, and now they're just, they're doing it on every issue, right? And they've done it here. And why do I say that? Because I think it's both courageous individuals, and I think it's a lesson about the kinds of ways that we have to work and the institutions, actually, that we have to sustain and the knowledge that we have to sustain, right? So, so the you know they learned their tactics from act up and from the like the activists who've been doing this kind of work for a long time and i think this you know even before hearing you say this one of the things i was going to say is i think the thing that's been critical to the success of the access to medicines piece which is what i've been most engaged on has been the um the conjunction of real fierce activist work being out there in the streets and the technical expertise um, and that's always been a, an MO, uh, like a, that's how AIDS activists have worked since there have been AIDS activists, right? ACT UP in the US always said, you know, we're in the streets and we're in the room, right? They're in the FDA, they're outside the FDA. And I think that's really critical. It's, it's critical um, and it's, it, I could tell many stories in, in the kind of episodes that were, I think, the big successes of the AIDS um, and access to medicines movement where, you know, whether it's India in the Novartis case, um, uh, where it was activists on the street along with experts inside the courtroom, right? And, and experts being gathered around the world through affidavits and other kinds of expert discourse, but also the activists in the street, right? The South Africa Competition Commission, the South African, you know, the European um, case, um, you know, the changes in trade policy, right? It's always been a conjunction of that activism and the kind of technical expertise. And so I think that's, I think that's part of the secret <laughs> of what has made some of these successes actually work. I also think it, it becomes a challenge over the longer term, right? How do you sustain both of those things at the same time? You know, um, how do you not fall into a sort of more technocratic way of operating, which just tends to be easier to fund tends to be more comfortable for a lot of people, right? And how do you sustain the links between the more activist side 
Um, I guess that relates to just one other thing I wanted to sort of throw out there, which is I think this particular model of kind of, we're the best experts in the room, because we can talk economics and we can talk science and we can talk, and we're also activists, like it, it has tended to be very issue focused, right? Because to be an expert, you gotta know a lot about pharma and, and, and economics, everything else, right? And so part of the puzzle for me is also how do we at this moment when our world is like up in flames, <laughs> Right? How do we connect with other movements that are bigger than ourselves and start to think like the challenge today is not like to make progress on access to medicines or to make progress on copyright, right? I mean, that's those are those challenges, but it's also like this vista that has opened up about how do you connect to the broader challenges to our, you know, our systems of government. Um, you know, like there's potential to really shift some of trade policy now. Like neoliberalism is under challenge in a way it hasn't been before. And so how do we connect our specific movements with all the expertise we have to a bigger picture that could make something that looks like broader change over the long term, which is I think what many of us would like. Sean, I think the idea was to have diverse perspectives from the panel, but I'm just going to echo <laughs> the prior points. <laughs> so, cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, so a few things that maybe to elaborate. And um, so I think one thing is that, you know, the idea, and this is a sort of an elaboration of what Amy was saying. I think ideas matter a lot. I think that we do better when our ideas are big and transformative, um, when we're ambitious and challenge. Um, paradigms and take on power than when we go narrow um, for a variety of reasons that I don't have time to go into, but I think that that's, our experience bears that out. That's, that motivates people in a different way than narrow stuff. It's not possible really to have that dynamic if the, if the demands are kind of too, too small. Um, a second thing where I think we've done well sometimes and not so well sometimes is I think language matters. Um, so Richard Stallman, um, always used to beat up a bunch of us for ever using the term intellectual property. And he kind of lost the fight. But, in, and, and I think we were wrong. I think he was right. I think intellectual property is just a mess of a construct and every time we say it, and it's hard not to, and sometimes it's impossible not to because it now stands for something, we're conceding a ton. We're conceding that things go together. We're conceding a monopoly model. And we're conceding there's a property when there should be commons and shared stuff. Berjou, do you all know Berjou? Stand up. <laughs> so Brajou works a public citizen. Brajou said I can't be on the panel unless I talk about digital trade. So digital trade is very important. Right? However, however, digital trade is a crummy term. As, and e-commerce is worse. So we gotta do better in the language on that stuff. I think, I think it's a challenge. And it's not like people haven't thought about it. I don't have any answers. I think sometimes we've done well and sometimes not. And when we don't do as well, we get in the way of this dynamic because you're not, it just, it's too hard to get people motivated about things that are too abstract. Third point relatedly is that stories matter a ton. We have a huge problem in intellectual property, there I'm using the term, is inherently an abstract concept and it's very difficult. There's like, you can intellectually get excited about it if you pay enough attention to understand what it's all about, but regular people don't get so motivated by that stuff. But stories grab people and move people and certainly in the access to medicines fight, it's been stories, life and death stories, that got people activated. Not, not the abstraction of, of life and death, but the, the concrete reality of identifiable people and, and a real problem. Uh, and then the last thing is just to echo the point that all that was standing, um, activism and movements and civil disobedience drive things forward. So, I give all credit, I, when Sean says that Jamie and I did stuff, it's like I went to a lot of meetings that Jamie was at. Um, so I give all credit to Jamie for the origin stuff, but I was around a lot of the early stuff, including what I think was the first meeting at the US Trade Representative's office on intellectual property pre-trips, I think. And um, not knowing that much, but being, you know, cantankerous, I, I said to the guy, look, what you're trying to do will kill millions of people in Africa. And he felt very comfortable saying, we don't work for people in Africa. That was, that was an okay answer then. And that became an inconceivable answer later. In fact, the, the Bush administration 
would never have said that. Even the Trump administration wouldn't say it. They, they actually were concerned about people in Africa. And a little bit actually it was because they literally got religion. But a lot of it, and primarily, was because of, of the activist stuff. It was, it, nothing would have moved. This conference really wouldn't be happening if Al Gore's presidential announcement speech wasn't disrupted by, by a small group of, of AIDS activists. And I'll just take one last story because we we're supposed to ourselves tell stories. And the power of civil disobedience, we did one of the infinite number of demonstrations outside of USTR. By now, things had elaborated, and there were ACT UP Philadelphia, and maybe the beginnings of Health Gap. And I just remember, those of you who are Americans might know it, and those of you who are not, but have visited, the, the US Trade Representative Office is right across from the old executive office building, right near the White House. It's a great place to have a demonstration, because it's kind of a narrow street. You don't need that many people, and it feels big. If you yell really loud, it echoes, and good stuff happens. So we had, a, we, no, I had nothing to do with it, but we had a lot of people out on the street, you know, several hundred, like three, four hundred people there is a big crowd. And it's loud and it's raucous and there's like, and people are protesting outside the U.S. Trade Representative Office on, on patents. And I'm thinking, this is a miracle. People are protesting on patents, but there's, there's no press. And then um, my friends start, like the drum bangs and the smoke is in the air and People march into the street according to a predetermined civil disobedience plan and, and shut down the street, which is not that big a deal there. And it's also really easy to do because it's a small street. And like, it's almost as if people, media and TV cameras appeared like were parachuted in. Like, I don't know where they came from, but people sit down in the street and all of a sudden there's, there's TV cameras everywhere and that becomes a big media story. So again, not even, it wasn't just the ideas and it wasn't even just the protest, it was people taking an extra risk and that drove things, and that's driven in the, in the access to medicine st area, at least. That's been just central to driving everything forward. So um, we love American University, and you've got a beautiful law school. But you got right, the key is not just to be in the halls here, but to be out in the streets out there. <laughs> well, it's tough to sort of uh, follow this crowd here. Um, um, I, I one story I want to tell about, uh, uh, about Amy. Um, um, Amy literally called me up one uh, day and, and invited me to go to uh, George Soros' apartment and, and, and debate somebody from Bristol Myers in his living room. Um, that's one of the first time I met her. So all these stories about George Soros, totally true. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, one of the most important parts of my life was uh, these issues about HIV and AIDS drugs. And, and, and part of it came about in part because uh, the people in South Africa working for the government, Dr. Oliver Shoshana, for example, and other people had read an article that Rob had written in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review article about the TRIPS agreement. And they contacted the center and uh, they were coming to Washington, D.C. To be, they're forced into some negotiation with USTR, and they and they tr they tracked down Rob, and that's how I met them. Actually, was through Rob. So, um, um, and um, and also, I Rob had written all this stuff about government-funded research uh, that uh, these long diatribes about the uh, diatribes that were really informative about the Bayh-Dole Act, and that's that's something I've been stuck with for a while. But uh, there's so many people out here in this audience that have taught me so much. I know that uh, my my the reason I started going to WIPO. I mean. Uh, I think yesterday or today, the, I um, can't remember which one, the, the, the House of Representatives finally passed the authorizing legislation for the Marrakesh Treaty for the Blind, which is one of the great moments I've had in my life to work on that. But like how I got, got involved in, in, in that process initially was that uh, Peter Yazzie and other people had convened this sort of group on this 1996 WIPO treaties. And then Pam Salmison and Jerome Reichman had written some paper about a database treaty. And I didn't really know crap about, uh, you know, like copyright or anything like that. I'm not a lawyer or anything. But it was, uh, uh, the database thing in particular was, uh, it was a concern to me. And it was written in such accessible language. It was, it was so easy to kind of follow the logic that, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, I, I ended up going to the diplomatic conference in 1996. And I've been, you know, I was in, I was in, the, dip I was in the General Assembly with WIPO. Um, um, uh, yes, uh, uh, Wednesday actually, uh, Wednesday morning. So I've, I'm still doing it, right? You know, but that's that's how these things happen. Sometimes, sometimes you kind of run, run into somebody. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting where you go to a meeting like this is a big, like lots of people out here, and um, 
I've been in meetings where like there are more people on the podium here than there are you know in the audience. But sometimes it's that one person that you bump into or two people that just really make all the difference in the world. So I think that um, relationships are incredibly important. Uh, the the ability to learn from other people and depend on other people and to help other people I think is really critical. My my sort of uh, Rob is sort of you know has a lot of views on messaging and things like that, and I'm kind of a, a, against all that. I, I say, you know, like, I, I don't care whether you call it Medicare for all or single payer. People will figure out what it is. Um, what's important is, you know, do you have a, a just cause? Do you have a good solution? And can you hold policymakers accountable? I think, to me, those are the sort of three components of a successful campaign. And I think the messaging, I leave that up to other people. I think that people are smart enough to figure out um, if you have passionate people that are committed and in it for the right reasons, they, they, they can kind of, they'll figure out how to message it. But if you don't have a just cause, and if you, if you don't have like a, you know, a good solution, um, uh, and if you're not willing to hold policymakers accountable, and sometimes you gotta like, it's gotta be uncomfortable sometimes. I mean, it's not always uh, easy street, right? That, you know, sometimes you have to sort of, Put yourself out there, and a lot of you have. Uh, you know, this this woman that you, the story about the woman uh, that you all talked about, you know, with Senator Flake, that was really a tough thing for somebody to do. And when the AIDS activist, you know, uh, did, did everything did around the world in different places to confront their governments, not, nothing would have happened if that, you know, that those people didn't do those things. Or people are like, you know, getting handcuffed and stuff like that. That's not easy to do. <laughs> it's also not easy to kind of buck your academic peers sometimes if you, if you want to sort of push things in a certain direction. I know that uh, on the treaty, uh, on some of these reform, I, like the Treaty for the Blind, I remember some professors said that, you know, it, it, because it broke the mold, they'd be disgraced as academics if they supported it because it just didn't make any sense to them. I, I don't want to talk forever. I, I'm going to close with just one thing, which is kind of like a negative thing, I guess, about, about the movement, because everyone's so positive, I have to be like you know, sort of the negative person for a second. But, um, <laughs> If I can think of one thing that's a problem for all, it's a challenge for us, and I'm as guilty as everybody else is, not, not that everyone's guilty, but I certainly feel like it's a problem, is that a lot of us, because uh, we're trying to get promotions or funding or something like that, we all have to kind of like brand ourselves and sort of push our own, you know, awesomeness, you know, all the time, you know. And, and then that gets in the way of collaboration and, and collaboration is really, none of us are really powerful enough to do much of anything. Together we can do quite a bit. Uh, in the early parts of the AIDS movement, nobody th thought for a minute they were gonna get any money or they were gonna get any fame, they just did it. <laughs> and it was amazing. Uh, and then there was a point when you know money started coming in and then the TV cameras were there and then things kind of started to fall apart for a while. <laughs> they kind of got back together. But I think that it's important uh, uh, to remember that I mean, we have to sort of tolerate when the other people are sort of like patting themselves back, taking credit, because if you don't, you're gonna go out of business, you're not gonna get funded, you're gonna not get promoted or whatever, you know. You have to do it, we all have to do it. But it's, 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 it's the worst part of what we have to do. The best part is when we get to work together and help each other, thank you. Good day, everyone. First, let me just thank the organizers of this uh, forum for providing me the opportunity to, you know, sit in a very, very uh, august panel here with people whose work I've learned uh, a lot from and has been a source of inspiration uh, to me. So, uh, you know, I'm really humbled uh, to be here. Many thanks. Um, you know, the great American Frederick Douglass once said that uh, power concedes nothing without demand. It never has and it never will. Now, I think that civil society organizations from my home country um, understand this very well. Uh, it is very clear that, uh, for anyone who's followed, that civil society organizations in South Africa have been instrumental in agitating and providing the necessary impetus uh, to create a political will to uh, make um, some of the changes that have been required over the years. Anecdotally, I'll give you an example of one day when I was called to the legislature when I, recent, when I had just joined uh, the Department of Trade and Industry that's responsible for uh, patent reform and, and the recently approved uh, policy on intellectual property. Um, 
So when I sat down, the very first thing that the uh, member of parliament or uh, our equivalent to Congress uh, said in, uh, in, 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 in that meeting was, you know, I've just received a, this pamphlet, which was a, a study, a 2016 study on um, patent barriers to cancer treatments that was uh, written by uh, a coalition of civil society organizations known as Fixer Patent Laws Coalition. And um, so he said to me, have you read this uh, paper? That was the very first thing that uh, he, he, you know, he said to me, this member of, uh, of Congress. And uh, fortunately for me, I had uh, just had a meeting uh, a couple of days ago with some of the people from civil society, and they had given me some copies so I could pull it out of my briefcase. Uh, and you know, it made the meeting with um, Parliament a lot easier. The point being that you know, the very fact that our civil society organizations are engaging, as Prof. Amy said, in uh, technical, um, you know, um, in, in technically sound work, and then um, distributing this to policymakers, uh, legislatures, uh, you know, members of the legislature, uh, it's been very, very um, helpful uh, to us. Um, I would also, um, you know, just, uh, as I say, so I would, I would really commend the civil society organizations uh, in South Africa uh, for, for that kind of engagement. I'd also uh, like also to thank, you know, um, American scholars, you know, people like Professor Frederick Abbott, people like Prof. Amy, uh, you know, um, Mr. Wiseman and others, uh, who have really, um, you know, done a lot of work uh, on South Africa um, and who have been very active and who really <clears throat> agitated both uh, domestically in the U.S. Uh, and internationally and really brought some of these issues uh, to, to the fore. In fact, I do recall that uh, the very first article that I ever read um, that sparked my interest in issues around intellectual property rights and public health was written by Professor Frederick Abbott, uh, his 2001 paper, uh, you know, lighting a dark corner uh, in the WTO on the Doha Declaration. So, you know, that kind of work has been very instrumental and, uh, you know, inspirational. So I think there's a lot of success stories, a lot of examples of how uh, scholarly work, technically sound work, uh, has been translated into um, strong uh, impetus for policymakers to, to work with. But I would also caution that uh, this is not the only kind of work uh, that's out there. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, other work that would go uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, and oftentimes this uh, work and the proponents of this kind of work are a lot more vociferous uh, in how they engage in, for example, media and so on. So uh, it's important that, uh, you know, people like yourselves who are progressive don't rest on your laurels, uh, that you also ensure that you engage with the media uh, and, uh, and, you know, and do actually uh, make uh, your progressive work uh, available. One thing that I would maybe lament uh, is that in South Africa, um, you know, and my colleague and, 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 uh, and, and very good friend, Professor, Professor Ngube, might not be happy with me uh, for saying this, but you know, one of the things that has been a bit of a, somewhat of a, a, a developmental error, let's say, in South Africa, is that um, in the intellectual property space, the, in, the, in, in terms of academia, the more, um, vocal people have tended to be uh, the regressive uh, and uh, conservative voices, um, it, both in the media uh, and in other public fora. The very many uh, progressive academics in South Africa have been, you know, you know quite, um, quite uh, conspicuous in uh, the silence in some of the fora. Um, and in, in fact, I would say that the likes of the American scholars have been um, you know, very, very more engaged, I would say. Uh, and, and, and so I would call for our colleagues in, in, you know, in, in, in South African academia to be more engaged uh, in the media and in other uh, fora like this to um, help to ensure that um, the very progressive work that's um, being done doesn't get drowned out by, um, by work that would go to um, erode. Uh, some of this kind of goodwill. In fact, it's very, very uh, dangerous because um, a lot of policymakers uh, would maybe only see a one article in their life uh, that deals with, um, you know, a, a complex issue like intellectual property rights and public interest, for example. And um, it's easy for um, an unfortunate impression uh, to form uh, if there isn't the consistent. Uh, counter narrative. So I would urge that um, you know my compatriots would perhaps be a bit more engaged in some of these fora.
uh, and I would also then uh, ask civil society to continue to uh, be as active as they've been. Uh, those would be my reflections. Um, and again, many thanks uh, to the organizers for this very, very um, excellent uh, opportunity. Thank you, Mar <clears throat> Marumo and everyone. So uh, one of the, thank you. So one of the, the, the interesting kind of strands and trends through this discussion was the, a lot of the, the medicine stories have this very strong activism aspect of it. And then I feel like, and we've been talking about this a lot, a lot of the copyright stories don't, that they're, they're a little bit stuck in the technocratic a little bit. Treaty for a bond, yeah, go ahead, Jim. It, it works, okay. <laughs> in the Treaty for the Blind negotiations at WIPO, every time there was a lot of blind people at a WIPO meeting, things moved forward. Every time there was a small number of blind people at the meeting, it didn't move very far. And that was really basically the most important thing that happened in that thing. So that's, that's one counterexample. And there's this example, I mean, Maruma from South Africa, the Fees Must Fall campaign, um, which maybe you want to describe that a little bit, but it wasn't an IP movement, but it was an education movement that has really been one of the most transformative movements that South Africa's maybe seen since the fall of apartheid, no? Well, I mean, I, I think, the, you know, there's other colleagues here that are more well-placed to sort of give, um, uh, you know, their reflections on the Fees Must Fall movement because they were you know, more uh, intimately involved than I in, in, the, in that particular movement. But you, of course you are quite right that um, there were, um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, lessons that can be learned about uh, activism from that particular movement. Yes. Under, yeah, Matt, can, there, there is one, there, an, another copyright, or at least related uh, counter would be the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, ACTA, um, which generated obviously huge amounts of uh, activity and action and, and people in the streets in much the way that uh, that we've we've heard earlier, and and, and I think I, we've we've long sought to try to identify how can we replicate that, or what took place within ACTA, because we didn't see it, for example, repeated over the last couple of months in Europe with uh, with Article 11, Article 13, uh, much to the chagrin I think of many in the room, where we had hoped that perhaps there would be a similar kind of uprising, and while there were many that um, were, were speaking out at least initially, there certainly wasn't the same kind of fervor or or action around that. But I do think that there has been, at least at times, a willingness to engage. I mean, you don't stop treaties uh, all that easily, and that's a good example where one, where one was stopped. I think in, in part it was because it, wasn't so, it certainly wasn't solely about copyright. There was strong views in, in line with thinking big, strong views around freedom of expression, around the implications for privacy, um, and, and notably, especially, uh, for many of the kinds of copyright related issues in the treaty negotiations, one of the things that perhaps is in response to some of the successes that we've just heard is that as this has shifted more and more towards secretive trade negotiations, it becomes, it can become tougher and tougher to galvanize, especially on the substance. So we can talk a lot about the lack of transparency around process, but I mean, it's notable that in an hour from now, the U.S. will release the text of the U.S.-Mexico trade agreement, which currently does not include my own country, Canada, um, but the very notion that there has been these ongoing negotiations, a fully completed text that on a Friday at seven o'clock will be released and presumably nobody in this room has had a chance to see it, much less have, have an impact as it's being discussed, represents an incredible, incredible challenge and I think a real threat on many of the kinds of issues that we care about because the trade agreements of the 80s and 90s aren't the same kinds of deals now. It's not just about tariffs, it's about many of these kinds of issues around copyright and patents and privacy and, and the like that are now taking place behind closed doors and presented a fait accompli. And so, and so one, I mean, the, so the one distinction between the Marrakesh Treaty and the ACTA Treaty is that the ACTA mobilization was kind of a, a more classic example of, of organizing around something being taken away from you as opposed to the Marrakesh Treaty is actually, was a positive agenda, right? It was actually trying to get something new added to the agenda. And I think one of the questions around in the, in the user rights committee now is whether the, whether the end goal of education offers a, a similar kind of framing device to shift towards a more active, tapping into the kind of movements that exist in South Africa and other places around students 
who affirmatively want access to educational materials. And then the expert agenda around trying to figure out you know, the new limitations and exceptions environment or open access environment, the various tools to get there. I wonder what any of you think about that as kind of a new agenda within that space to tap the kind of tools that have been successful in the past that we've talked about. Um, my, my take on some of these is that there, there are some issues where you can have a lot of impact, um, either you know, slowing down or mitigating sort of bad things or making something positive happen with a fairly technical audience because it's, it's hard to kind of go to the streets with some issues because they're just hard to kind of communicate with. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, you got all these people registered at the conference and, and I must say that Sean's efforts at sort of pulling these things together has really been really hard to sort of put into words like how valuable that is to everyone to have th these kind of events and, and particularly as well, as well as you and your whole crew and all the people work on it have, have done to pull it together. It really helps, but like the people, uh, all these sort of policy wonks and stuff you like here, you can actually, on some issues, you're, you're probably the, the people that are going to have to carry the ball. There's other issues where you really, you know, it, it is more grassroots, it is more on the streets, it is more, and it, it, but it, they're, they're not all the same, uh, these issues, but they're, just because it's complicated to explain and maybe not something you can go to the streets doesn't mean it's not worth fighting over because it, um, you know, it, it really can be. And the other thing is transparency. I think so many people's issues benefit from more transparency of every aspect of the intellectual property system. So one thing I'd like to see is political parties to have a platform in their political party that said, this is what our platform is on transparency as it relates to intellectual property in terms of, you know, all the different things you can cram in there. What is research and development cost on new drugs? Are the trade negotiations open? Uh, who gets the royalties from copyright? You know, you can just, just have a long list. So I want to bring in, um, I, I have a couple ringers in the audience, but Arul, so you've been involved, Arul Scaria from National University of Delhi has been involved in both the links between uh, the lawyers and the advocacy around access to educational materials in India. And I wonder if you give us a little bit of that, pose a question, you know. We have a lot to uh, learn from the past for what we want to achieve in future. So uh, just a short comment. So when you were talking about the success stories, I was asking myself what success story from India I would like to see myself getting replicated. And maybe one of the things which I consider as a success story from recent times is a kind of collaboration that happened between academia and the activists during the Delhi University photocopy shop case. But the broader question is, how will we see the same enthusiasm getting replicated for addressing the broader challenges? Someone here talked about the Marrakesh Treaty. Yes, India was very enthusiastic uh, in with regard to I mean signing the treaty and also incorporating the provisions. But do we see a similar enthusiasm from the side of academicians as well as the activists when it comes to implementation of these provisions on ground? I think that's something completely missing. A similar situation you can see when it comes to all the treaty negotiations, how many academicians actively participated in the RCEP related negotiations. So again, what we see is a complete disconnect between the academia and the activists. So maybe one question which I have for the panelists would be, how do we ensure that the, that kind of a collaboration or that kind of a momentum can be uh, continued throughout? Who wants it? Um, I was thinking about this issue when Jamie was also talking about maybe we should say some bad things about us <laughs> ourselves and uh, failures. And I think one of the things that makes collaborations between activists and academics hard is that academics are shaped by their desire to publish things. And then what do you publish? You know, the most important question for most academics is, is it new? Which is not even, is it right? You know, <laughs> um, uh, or is it useful to the world? But is it new? Um, and 
and that's a very deep feature of academia, and it's how our own institutes, you know, we don't have to fundraise, right, or some academics do, but we have less pressure from that, you know, brand yourself, but there's a different kind of pressure to sort of, you know, get a name by making, you know, making a name for yourself by, by writing something new. And then, then academic conversations, you know, make some issues academic and others not. And so when I came to law school and I was working on these kind of activist issues, there, you know, it was hard to figure out how to connect them to the academic conversation, you know, and I, I think we always are gonna have that problem. And so one version would be academics should reflect on that structure and say, well, maybe we should also be doing something useful <laughs> um, and not just doing something new, and it ought to count that something's right and not just that it's novel. Um, and, and that, but I don't know that I have a the deep solution for it. I think the other thing is that I've been trying to convince academics that the way you do the best academic work is by working with activists, because I think one of the interesting things about this collaboration is that much of the academic work came after the activist work or led by the activist work. I mean, a lot of my work has been shaped by Jamie and other activists in this room who I think gave me a sense of what issues are worth working on and then where are the solutions and how do you, you know, how do you engage them? So I think that's, you know, part of it is changing the mindset of the academy, that this is where you go to find interesting problems, and then you have to figure out how to make them academic problems, and the problem is in the academy that this isn't a question, and we should figure out how to make it a question. Um, and then, but that's, it's hard, and it's hard particularly when we have young students who they want to get into the academy, and if writing on new questions, opening up new questions is hard, so we have to figure out how to support them. If I could, if I could just supplement, I think it, it's a great question. It, it highlights to me how academics need to rethink, in some ways, the different kinds of roles that we can play. Um, and in this room, there are a lot of people who have played many of those roles, the interventions um, and, um, and amicus briefs that people like Pam Samuelson and Peter have submitted. We had a case in Canada just a week or so ago. The Supreme Court released its decision with respect to copyright and the notice system. And my colleague, Jeremy De Beer, in the audience was one of the people who, who argued, argued that, infamously telling the court that it's not a notice, that it's a notice notice system, not notice in Norwich, and um, deserves a lot of credit for actually getting the court to understand the privacy implications of that kind of decision. But to, to have that, and I must say, I'm struck by the number of panelists who talked about the article that they read one time that had an impact, which to me highlights, especially when you think about the desire to to have an impact, not just people in this room, but people around the world, the necessity of ensuring that we publish under open access licenses so that our works are openly and freely available so that the next generation of people have access to those materials and they're not um, locked behind subscriptions. Um, we, need, we need the infrastructure, the kinds of clinics that people like Pam Samuelson have been funding. Um, we need uh, academics who are willing to say that it's not just about the next scholarly article, but it's trying to find ways to ensure that uh, the work that I do has impact, both in implementation, as you say, and in a range of different ways, whether that's appearing before a regulator or a legislator or a court, uh, or trying to feed the next generation of people who might do that. Let me ask uh, Mariana Valente, who's one of the directors of the Internet Lab in, in Brazil, to kind of bring some of the Brazilian experience into the, into the discussion. I mean, so much amazing work's been done on copyright there and pushing for process and an open process to try to gain leverage um, with, with civil society and activists. And let me turn it to you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, well, I guess the question is, what can we learn from the past? And I'm speaking from a country that had a very, had a very interesting process of copyright law in place. Uh, and basically it died, right? So I guess the question is, what can we learn from that process? And I think there are many things, but one of them, I've been doing research the last years on the previous process, the, the process of reforming the copyright law back in 1998. And when you look at that process, what you see really is that in Brazil, there wasn't any discourse, any rhetoric on access to knowledge whatsoever. Uh, and we really started this rhetoric in 2003. And when you analyze the disputes at that time, uh, you really see that it was all about something else. And when we started talking about um, access to knowledge afterwards, I don't think we properly connected with the disputes that were in place, which were basically between creators and the industry. There was a very long and interesting story on that, uh, on forming associations and on there being like real, real disputes. Uh, and actually, when you talk to these people nowadays, they've all developed like something 
pretty much against the access to knowledge uh, rhetoric. And it feels to me that if we had been able to better connect with the progressive forces that were in place then, we could have reached better results. There was actually a small reform in 2013, which was uh, about collective management. And it just passed because it was the artists uh, joining for the reform and going to Congress and doing lobbying. And uh, we see that when that happens in the country, actually we achieve really interesting results. So perhaps having been able to connect uh, uh, the worldwide discussions uh, that we're having, the worldwide discussions on access to knowledge to what was happening, on the ground uh, would have led to better results. Um, so if you can comment on that, on other experiences like that, I think that would be helpful for us to um, sort of have uh, uh, inputs on how to move forward. I think if anyone wants to comment, I mean, one of the themes is the connection between the process and the results and, you know, how, how did the pieces that we don't always control fit, fit you know, shape our advocacy, but Jamie? Well, in the international negotiations, uh, in, in the old days, it was Brazil, India, um, uh, you know, a select number of countries, uh, in, in, in developing countries in particular, which were really the most important voices in terms of protecting user rights, limitations and exceptions, that sort of thing. Um, White is right now poised for a diplomatic conference on a treaty to give broadcasting organizations a 50-year right on top of copyright, or even if there is no copyright, from when a work is distributed by them, even though they didn't pay for it or license it or create it or anything. It would essentially be a kind of perpetual right. And um, Brazil was flipped by O Globo. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be curious to South Africa and not mention their situation, but I would say that <laughs> Uh, the African group has been a disappointment in general in uh, Kenya and, and, and some other countries. India has been flipped by the Z networks. Um, believe it or not, it's the United States right now is our biggest ally in stopping that treaty, which is kind of an unusual situation on these kind of issues for me. Um, but um, uh, uh, there's almost uh, nobody in the room in, in, in these conversations. It's really hard to get... Um, if I was to go back 10 years ago, 2007, you know, when the, when the WIPO development agenda was being negotiated, there would be like 20 or 30 NGOs in the back of the room, you know, mingling with delegates, you know, posting blogs, talking about stuff and things like that. It was amazing. And uh, when we did the Treaty for the Blind, they stopped coming because they weren't blind. They, were, they thought it was a, you know, special. They weren't stakeholders and stuff like that. It became a much smaller group and then it just never, never came back, you know, it's just kind of unfortunate. So, um, um, you know, I, you know I, it is a rough, it is a dangerous world out there. We're not really necessarily going in the right direction all the time. You know, there's been some victories and there's we're, we're a lot of risk and stuff out there. So I think it's, it's tough. It is true that if you have somebody that's gonna benefit from somebody directly economically, they are perceived by um, most uh, m most of the negotiators just think they're just more legitimate people. They're more important. If you just show up and say, I'm like the general public. I don't like this. They go, well, who the hell are you? You know, <laughs> you're just like one person. But if you go up and say, I'm an artist or I'm a songwriter, I'm an author or something like that. It's like, oh yeah, really? You know, let's hear your story and what can we do for you, you know? So there is this super big, and, and I think in the, in the minds of delegates, they just think that the people that are making money off the thing are gonna make the country rich. They don't do the math about, you know, uh, where the money goes or how much it goes overseas or anything like that. But it's, it, it, you know, it, it is a, I don't know how, what, the, what the solution is, but it is a really tough situation. Kajal, Kajal Bardwaj, one of the track leaders from the Access to Medicines group in India in the last Global Congress and an AIDS activist in India. But let me give you the final question. Yes, the infamous Global Congress in India. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had an anecdote and a, and a question and I, uh, to talk about you know, the, the links between academics and activists. And it's my favorite story about Amy. And it was through the Novartis case uh, where the final hearing was happening in the Supreme Court. And we sort of realized, uh, I was working with some of the lawyers of the Lawyers Collective, that we needed to actually get in more stuff from academics talking about evergreening. And fortunately, Amy had just co-authored a piece on this, and we contacted her from Delhi and had her running 
all over trying to do an affidavit and there was a very particular process that the Supreme Court of India required for affidavits from abroad uh, and she ran all over and we filed it and, it and it made a difference. We know in terms of, you know, it wasn't just the, the uh, patients groups who were saying there was a problem, you had academic backup. But the reason I'm also bringing up that case was because this was a case where there was an academic intervention and it was an intervention that most of the activists did not like and it led to a lot of unpleasantness. And so I have a difficult question for you that have you been in situations where there are tensions between academics and activists? And how do you think that those should be resolved? Or have you had a successful resolution of those situations? Um, because that was one of the unpleasant parts of the Novartis case. And I don't think we figured out a way to have conversations when we have disagreements with academics. So. I don't know the story, so you're, you're referring to something very specific. So I, I'm not sure that I'm, my reaction is probably not what you're saying if I'm guessing what you're saying. I mean, but I think that academics are contested. Like there's some, there's some friends, but most of them are enemies, right? <laughs> because of the money. Like I don't know what world, I mean, Amy, she's like at a fancy university with Brett Kavanaugh and stuff, so she doesn't worry about raising money, but <laughs> most academics are worried about raising money. You know, and Google's funding like everybody, right, in the IP space. And if they're not, it's Oracle. We know that because Oracle's funding the investigations of who Google's funding. Um, and it's the same with, it's the same in, in the patent side and, and, and the drug companies. So I think we have fights with them all the time. This is probably not responsive to what you're saying. But I mean, well, I think one piece of that actually goes to this issue of transparency. So that's, I mean, in, in this area, again, I think that's, that's a huge, I think that's a huge problem in academics is the, the non-disclosure of, of all kinds of funding streams or the, maybe it's disclosed somewhere if you click through 30,000 things you can find it because one journal had it once but then when they publish in the New York Times they didn't disclose it, oh yeah by the way paid for by pharma. So that's, that's a piece. In terms of, um, I assume that your story is really about like allied academics and not really, and then of course the, the, the activists are right and the academics should just listen. <laughs> right? It, I, yeah, I, one of the questions, I'm, uh, so, well, I kind of believe that, but apart from that, you know, it's a, it's a dialogue, right? I mean, one of the pre-questions that Sean sent around to us, I think, is, um, you know, how much we all have to be on the same page, more or less, is the version of the question, and the answer is, it depends. But also, you, we don't get to just say, okay, this is the time we're all on the same page. You, you, like sometimes diversity of stuff and we difference of views is just part of the world and we have, to, we have to navigate it. I do think, again, I don't know your story. I'm sorry, you keep calling me and I don't know your story. But um, it, it, it's easier for me to say from where, we, from where I sit probably than where you sit. But I mean, the academics should be more humble, right? Even if they've, they've got strong views. Um, but there's there's sometimes a disconnect from the, the actual struggle and the actual fight. And also, there's this power imbalance that goes on, um, which I'm just guessing was infusing part of your, your situation. And, um, you know, but activists are activists, so you, like, you have to impose that on people. That's, like, that's the best answer I got. So I want to thank all of our panelists. This conference is uh, explicitly designed, as I'm sure you've found, to keep you hungering for more and never get to the complete conversation. But we have two other aspects of it. So even though I have 15 more questions written down that I didn't get to, uh, we're going to stop this one and invite uh, Pam Samuelson to come up. So thank you, everyone, for being part of this discussion. And Pam, let me invite you up. So I want to start by thanking Sean and Mike Carroll and all of the people at American University for organizing 
a really phenomenal event. I, I think one of the things, I go to a lot of conferences, um, uh, but uh, one thing that I think is especially good about this is uh, that it really has fostered dialogue among uh, people who are academics, uh, activists, and NGOs, uh, and that's not very common, so uh, to be able to do that is really uh, spectacular. Um, uh, and uh, the other thing is that um, uh, people here, I think, really do have a sense of community. And I will also really congratulate uh, them for um, uh, not having exactly the same panel over and over and over again. Um, there are always new ideas coming out. And also, I like the variety of formats that uh, that, that uh, people have had book launches and fireside chats and panels and TED Talks. Uh, so um, uh, really uh, great congratulations to all of you for, uh, for that. Um, uh, I thought that I would uh, focus today on um, justifications for uh, limitations and exceptions, or as we might call them, uh, user rights in intellectual property regimes. Uh, there are times when we want to uh, promote the idea of more exceptions and limitations, and I think one of the things that we need to be thinking about, what are the varieties of explanations and justifications there are for the exceptions that are already in uh, some national laws, and then how can we use the justifications to think about well, what else might go into that particular, uh, into that particular bin. So um, uh, obviously there are many, many types of uh, limitations that are built into intellectual property uh, regimes, uh, and there are also some uh, types of limits that are external uh, to IP regimes. So antitrust and consumer protection law, um, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression, privacy interests and the like, uh, those things uh, occasionally um, uh, will um, uh, give rise to some limitations to uh, the extent to which intellectual property rights would be uh, uh, would be enforced. Uh, but uh, I want to focus today on what we have conventionally called uh, limitations and exceptions. Uh, uh, as we all know, the kind of the conventional sort of way that the law has been structured is through a broad grant of rights, and then identifying specific types of limitations. Uh, that should be uh, recognized, uh, and that can sometimes be done through statutes, sometimes through uh, adjudications, uh, and uh, in the United States recently, especially with the anti-circumvention rules, uh, through administrative proceedings. So there are a number of different mechanisms for trying to uh, do something about it. Um, uh, my idea for this paper really grew out of um, uh, work that Bert Hugenholtz and uh, some other European colleagues who were participants in uh, what's known as the Whittem Group. Um, and one of the things that they did is they tried to think in a systematic way about uh, what kinds of exceptions and limitations are there and why do we have them. If you just try to read the exceptions and limitations um, uh, from 107 through 122 of the U.S. statute uh, or uh, all of them that are listed in the InfoSoc directive, you just sort of say, jumble, 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 jumble. Um, so it, they don't, they're not grouped according to any kind of um, thing that makes any sense at all. Uh, so um, um, maybe because I, I like taxonomies, um, I decided that I would uh, be inspired by the ones that, uh, that Berndt and the Whittem Group had put together. Um, and I think if you're trying to sort of uh, um, collapse all of them down to three categories or four, I think these are actually pretty good, uh, pretty good examples of fundamental freedoms, public interest, uh, market failure, I think, are, are good ones. Um, uh, but me, I'm like, you know, I, I read all 330-some um, fair use decisions that had been uh, issued between 1978 and 2007, um, and I read them in the order in which they had been written, um, so it was pretty cool. Um, and, um, uh, and so what I discovered is that there are lots of different kinds of uh, justifications, and then I went through the statute and said, okay, for the things that aren't done by fair use, what buckets do they belong in? So um, I'm gonna take you on a little tour of my own personal uh, taxonomy. 
so, uh, uh, so my taxonomy was for copyright, and I'll come back to uh, um, uh, how that taxonomy might work in terms of other types of intellectual property regimes. Uh, but one of the functions that I think uh, everybody can agree upon uh, is that we want to have some exceptions, the fair quotation exception, uh, the kind of critical commentary uh, uh, exception that promotes ongoing authorship, right? And so the fair quotation right in the Berne Convention, uh, the parody exceptions that are in a number of uh, uh, national laws. Um, fair use does most of the work uh, here. Um, uh, the rap uh, parody song uh, in the Campbell versus Jacob Rose case, uh, for example. Uh, so uh, in my paper, uh, Unbundling Fair Uses, which is available online if you're interested, uh, I try to go through actually a dozen different types of things that promote ongoing authorship. It's not just um, the fair quotation right. There are actually a number of other ways in which um, uh, ongoing authorship are benefited um, by, uh, by things like fair use and fair quotation uh, rights. Obviously, we also very much care about fostering public uh, access to uh, information and also the public interest in freedom of expression so critical commentary, in particular, news reporting uh, exceptions, uh, those which allow, even under the Berne Convention, some greater flexibility to use um, uh, in copyright materials to, uh, news, to engage in news reporting or uh, disseminate information about current political or economic activities. I'm going to put Orphan Works uh, 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 exceptions as another one of the things that's like, Let's get more access to more information. Um, so those are my first, uh, my first two. Uh, a cluster that um, often doesn't get um, recognized as such, but I think is a really important one, and that is uh, uh, justifications that are about protecting the privacy, autonomy, and ownership interests of, uh, uh, of uh, purchasers of copies of copyrighted works or people who get access to it. Uh, so um, uh, the time shift copying in the Sony Betamax case uh, from 1984 uh, under the Fair Use Doctrine uh, was an example of that. Um, the exhaustion of rights doctrine, right? The fact that if when you purchase something that you get to resell it or you get to lend it or you get to give it away um, is a real protection for the, uh, for the autonomy and uh, property interests of, uh, of individuals. Obviously, the private use exceptions that are in a number of different laws and also um, it's the public performance, the public display, the communication to the public uh, that's supposed to be regulated. And so that private um, performance, that private display, that pr private communication uh, really is an unregulated space that um, I think um, uh, it's not usually an explicit type of thing, but I think is part of the limitations that we could recognize. Uh, backup copying privileges uh, in, uh, for software uh, in a number of uh, countries' laws also play that role. Um, uh, I certainly agree uh, wholeheartedly with the uh, Hugenholz and the Whittem group that public interest exceptions, things like the library, archive, uh, museum, uh, preservation and access uh, rules, uh, the extent to which uh, educational uses uh, are uh, sometimes privileged uh, altogether and sometimes subject to remuneration, but at least you can do it, uh, and then enabling uh, uh, access to uh, information by print disabled people is really enabling those people to engage in uh, the world and become productive citizens that uh, is something that we all really share uh, as, a, as a value. Um, Again, less notice, but I think worth mentioning uh, is the extent to which uh, fair use sometimes enables uh, public institutions to function. Uh, so uh, many nations have le uh, exceptions that are about if I have to make a copy in order to investigate a crime or to adjudicate a case or to, uh, to uh, have, part, have something happen in an administrative proceeding, you know, that's not exploiting the expression for, uh, in the way that uh, 
that copyright law really uh, is concerned with. And I'll just tell you very briefly my favorite fair use case out of this set. So Bond versus Bloom. I'll, I'll give you a really short version of it. So Bond uh, was the second husband of Bloom's daughter. And he wanted custody of the kids from the first marriage. So the father basically tries, sent out a private detective to find uh, out information about him that might actually undermine the, uh, the argument that he should get custody of the kids. And he managed to find, his investigator managed to find a manuscript about, about Bond having killed his father and getting away with it. And then when Bloom brought it and made copies for the judge and the lawyers um, and tried to introduce it into evidence, he sued him for copyright infringement. <laughs> <laughs> judge said it was fair use. Um, uh, uh, so uh, that's, uh, you know, a little levity is good. Um, uh, obviously, Another function that uh, fair use serves uh, very often in the United States and that uh, specific exceptions uh, exist in, a many, uh, in many countries' laws uh, are for things that foster competition and ongoing innovation. Again, the reverse engineering of software uh, in order to uh, achieve interoperability, to fix bugs or the like, uh, repair rights, adaptation rights uh, to some degree are really about uh, enabling uh, this uh, competition and ongoing innovation. Uh, incidental uses, uh, again, from my standpoint, again, I, I agree with the Widom group uh, about that. If a copy doesn't have economic significance, uh, it's really not the sort of thing that we ought to have. And so having a, a specific exception that basically says that incidental uses are not, um, uh, are not infringing is a, a good thing to do. Uh, there are a number of exceptions also that aim to cure market failure. Um, and in the United States, uh, that explains, uh, generally speaking, the compulsory licenses uh, that exist for cable satellite uh, retransmissions, the re recording of music, and various digital music services uh, that um, are out there. And um, Right? If you can't get all the people in the room and there's not really a competitive market, you need something to basically enable the access to happen uh, even if some money has to change hands. Now, um, uh, one of the things that Baron Hugenholtz uh, liked to say is that there's some things that are just political expedience, right? So this is just public choice stuff working out. Um, and, um, uh, and so uh, uh, for him, um, uh, the agricultural horti horticultural fair exception in U.S. copyright law was like, what's that doing there? Why don't they get? You know? So the the reason I think is very similar to the reason why we had a jukebox exception under the 1909 Act, which is that there um, there are 4-H clubs in every uh, in every part of the the Midwest and the and the and the Far West and. They say, you know, we can't have our fare if, if we have to pay uh, ASCAP uh, licenses. And so, you know, you got a jukebox uh, in every restaurant at the time that this was passed. The exception is going to happen because, and it's going to be preserved because uh, of political uh, reasons. But um, I didn't find actually that many of those kinds of exceptions. Um, another one of Bernd's favorites uh, is the Italian marching band exception to go out and do marching band on Sunday mornings. They have a special exception for that. Uh, it's cute. Um, and then I think the tenth, and uh, for me, one of the most powerful arguments for having exceptions and limitations is to achieve some flexibility and adaptability in an age of rapid um, a rapid technological change and rapid change um, in every way. And so obviously, Americans really like that fair use defense and consider that one of its great benefits is uh, to provide a kind of balancing mechanism for achieving uh, adaptability of copyright law in the face of uh, a legislature that can't possibly imagine all the things that need to happen uh, or are going to happen. And you can't pass a law every, uh, every six months when, things, uh, when some new technology uh, comes along. But 
Uh, one of the things that I like about a lot of the work that's been done, especially by my European colleagues, uh, is really kind of recognizing that maybe fair use is not going to fly in Europe, um, but maybe there are other kinds of doctrines that can uh, serve some of the same functions. And uh, even Canada's expansion of the fair dealing concept, uh, I think, is something that uh, at least gives you a little bit of uh, a room to move. And uh, uh, Daniel Gervais talks about a reverse three-step test uh, that would essentially adapt the three-step test, which is usually seen as something that combines exception, as something that could enable uh, 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 the, the flexibility uh, function uh, that US fair use does. Um, so obviously, uh, one of the things that's, uh, that's curious is that Copyright law has lots and lots and lots of exceptions, right? Japan's law has 75 of them. Um, and some countries have 40 and some, and uh, it's hard to count them in the United States because there are a lot of them that are kind of bundled in uh, any particular uh, provision. So I'm not going to tell you how many there are because I can't tell. Um, but nevertheless, if you kind of think about um, at least patent law, um, it's notable that there are fewer of the exceptions that one finds. Obviously, the exhaustion of rights principle applies, and it has some of the same benefits uh, in, the, uh, in the patent system as it has uh, in copyright, promoting competition and innovation and protecting the ownership interests of uh, the people who have purchased uh, uh, instances, uh, embodiments of inventions. Um, many countries have uh, experimental use exceptions, which also uh, promote foster access to information uh, and promote innovation and ongoing uh, uh, competition as well. Uh, so um, some of those, one of the things that we can try to do is like kind of understand what are the benefits of this for the public as well as for the kind of ongoing innovation that we want to see happen. And of course, compulsory licenses uh, uh, do happen in the patent regime, uh, partly for public interest and partly uh, for, uh, for market failure um, uh, reasons. And there are some public policy limits also on trade secrecy rights. Uh, and I mentioned here one uh, exception that's been uh, litigated uh, recently, um, uh, or has been litigated, which is the, the right of the government to reuse data about the effectiveness of a particular fungicide to enable um, uh, a generic firm to enter, uh, to enter the market. So um, I think that we can find some examples. And part of what we want to say is like, well, why does copyright have so many? And why don't we have more of them in patent? And if we had more of them in patent, which of those justifications might possibly be uh, useful to, uh, to draw upon. So um, uh, obviously at a, at a meeting like this, we want to think about uh, ways in which scholars and activists uh, can really work together, uh, whether it's through proposing uh, new exceptions, uh, such as the text and data mining exceptions that are now in uh, Jap Japan's uh, copyright law, and that the European Union is at least doing a little bit um, in that space, although not enough. So they're going to lose out in the AI thing, so too bad for them. Um, uh, making case for the liberalization of existing um, uh, uh, limitations and exceptions. Uh, just today, a white paper was uh, issued about uh, a new uh, um, uh, effort to uh, promote controlled digital lending. Um, uh, and the point here is to sort of enable libraries to feel more comfortable at least about commercially inactive works that copies of which might be in their collection. If you digitize it and you don't lend out um, the digital copy and the, and the physical copy at the same time, uh, why shouldn't people be able to read it um, online? And so I hope that you'll have a chance to take a look at the position statement that some of us here in the room have uh, uh, have endorsed and also the, uh, the white paper that explains why uh, this, uh, uh, why it's a reasonable interpretation uh, of copyright law, at least in the United States, uh, to do something of this sort. Um, uh, one of the things that I think has also been really fruitful is the kind of studies that have been done to sort of say, 
where are there exceptions and limitations in national laws on education or on uh, libraries or whatever? And then borrow ideas, right? If I only have an exception that's this broad, but there are other countries that have exceptions that are broader, maybe I ought to think about whether or not um, we can make a case for broadening the exception for libraries, the exception for educational uh, uses. And so I think that's another kind of thing that something like this Global Congress is really uh, uh, good for, advocating for uh, uh, comfort levels about adopting um, fair use and, and liberalization of fair dealing, um, and a recognition of users as having uh, rights, uh, not just a defense to infringement. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot of work to do also to uh, help uh, policymakers and sometimes courts to recognize that um, uh, limitations and exceptions shouldn't be uh, routinely overridden by contracts uh, or technical protection measures. Uh, again, there are mechanisms in Europe and in the United States to try to liberalize that, but we have to take advantage of it because if we don't, it won't happen. Uh, so uh, there's that. Um, I think there's work to be done in Europe to get more mandatory exceptions uh, out of that list that came in the InfoSoc directive, um, and uh, obviously exercising compulsory license flexibility uh, for health and access to information um, is a, another kind of uh, set of things that we can kind of think about. Well, there is that thing called the TRIPS agreement and the three-step test. Um, so I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't say something about them too. Uh, so the TRIPS agreement uh, uh, contains a couple of different, uh, not exactly the same, but they have in common uh, a test that basically says that limitations and exceptions to intellectual property rights uh, should be li li confined to certain special cases uh, that don't conflict with a normal exploitation of the intellectual property rights or otherwise unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of rights holders. Um, there have been two challenges uh, to uh, exceptions and limitations in uh, national laws. The first one uh, was the European Union's challenge to the, um, uh, the um, uh, fairness and Music Licensing uh, uh, Law uh, um, from a number of years ago, which broadened the exemption that um, retail establishments and, and restaurants had already um, to allow more speakers and to allow a little bit bigger space uh, to, uh, uh, to be um, uh, exempt from, uh, from licensing. Uh, and the European Union challenged that and said, no, you can't do that. Uh, and the panel that, um, uh, that ruled on that said it didn't even pass a certain special cases uh, stamp, uh, a step of the, uh, of the test. And um, uh, besides, it also was, uh, uh, was in conflict with normal exploitation and unreasonably right. So you flunked all three of those uh, US government um, on that particular thing. Now, it's noticeable that we didn't actually change our law. But um, uh, I don't, you know, I'm not privy to that. But, um, but the point is that that challenge, uh, some of the language in that particular um, opinion uh, by the panel uh, boded pretty badly for uh, any kind of defense to fair use in the U.S. So uh, Ruth Okedeji, who whose work I very, very much admire, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that in this room, um, wrote a piece in 2000 basically saying, ah, oh, fair use may not be consistent with the, with the TRIPS agreement. Um, uh, and she looked at the panel opinion uh, about it and uh, uh, said, mm, maybe not. Now, I think her view has liberalized since then. And I read a paper recently by uh, Mihaly Fisor that said US fair use is consistent with TRIPS. Uh, so I'm going to hold that man to that, uh, to that, uh, to that statement. Uh, but there was also a, a challenge to um, uh, a Canadian um, uh, exception uh, that essentially enabled uh, generic companies to stockpile uh, to make drugs for the purpose of stockpiling them so that when the, ex so when the term of uh, patent expired, they could go into the, the market, and that was actually also 
uh, said not to uh, be compatible with the TRIPS agreement. So I actually just finished writing a paper um, about uh, uh, fair use and the three-step test. Um, and I started actually by looking at um, what happened at the time that the United States joined the Berne Convention back in 1989. Uh, and uh, there were um, 15 um, foreign, mostly European, uh, experts who came to Congress and testified about, you got to change this, and you got to change this, and you got to change this, and you got to change that. And fair use didn't come up, OK? Um, and uh, Arpad Bosch uh, uh, was uh, asked about um, uh, the exceptions and limitations to US copyright law. And the only one he had a problem with was a jukebox compulsory license. Uh, so um, I think that was a real acceptance of, of the compatibility of fair use uh, at the time uh, of the uh, US joining the Berne Convention. Uh, and one of the things that I think is uh, important to sort of recognize is that countries have different ways of essentially adopting exceptions and limitations. So the civil law tradition is you basically have the rights and then you name the specific exceptions. Uh, but the way that US actually does it is it uh, evolves exceptions through the common law adjudication process. Uh, and because the, uh, the fair use cases uh, basically fall into uh, uh, what I call policy relevant clusters, um, I think they are for certain special cases. And there's been a lot of empirical work uh, lately that really suggests that that um, that that's true, that, that the fair use is much more predictable um, than a lot of people have said. Uh, I don't think anything in TRIPS changed that standard. Um, uh, so if it was OK under the Berne Convention, I don't see why, why uh, five years later, especially because the negotiations for TRIPS are going on at the same time, that it would be uh, out of keeping. Uh, so uh, I identify in the paper um, uh, some post-TRIPS developments that I think bolster the argument that actually fair use is compatible with the three-step test. Um, so one I've already mentioned, which is the work of uh, Barton Beebe, uh, Michael Madison, Neil Netanel, Matthew Zegg, uh, to kind of refine uh, the, the analysis of the fair use uh, cases uh, uh, to show how specific they are. Um, there's also a really uh, interesting paper that uh, that Justin Hughes did, which was thinking about fair use as basically a mechanism for creating new exceptions. And I think uh, he makes an argument there that that's because it's a mechanism. It's not itself an exception. It's basically a mechanism for it uh, that it's the that it's tri trips compatible. Um, I think the uh, the fact that uh, fair use and broader fair dealing uh, rules are getting adopted uh, in many countries um, uh, again. If they were all scared of a TRIPS violation, I think there would have been uh, some greater resistance to it. And uh, I think that now um, nobody in the United States except Jane Ginsburg um, thinks that it's out of compliance with the TRIPS agreement. Um, and I, 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 have, I have some reactions to her arguments in my paper. Um, OK. Um, and also the fact that the. Um, the WIPO Copyright Treaty in 1996 essentially endorsed uh, not only uh, carrying over uh, existing exceptions to the digital environment, but also adopting uh, new ones. It's very uh, hospitable. Um, uh, there's, I think, also been a broader recognition in the European Union, among other places, uh, that um, we need some flexible balancing doctrine in a uh, time of rapid change. Uh, and we even see some more open-ended public interest freedom of expression exceptions kind of rising up in some of the national uh, cases in other places. So fair use is not alone in being a kind of standard instead of a, uh, a rule. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Max Planck de Declaration uh, about the compatibility of open exceptions, but if you haven't read it, you want to look for it. Um, and so in conclusion, I want to say um, this Global Congress is an amazingly wonderful back, uh, venue uh, for activists and academics to come together and really uh, brainstorm and foster this kind of sense of community uh, and shared values uh, so that we can support existing um, limitations and exceptions. 
um, and liberal interpretations of them to the extent that we get pushback, um, we can muster arguments that respond to them. Uh, and then we want to imagine how the public interest in intellectual property can be fostered uh, through other kinds of balancing uh, mechanisms. And I think by identifying what I consider to be like the, the 10 different ways that, uh, that uh, uh, exceptions can be justified, that I think that frees our imagination to think about what other things we might want to do. And then obviously we need to work together uh, to build um, the uh, support from the public, from legislatures and, uh, and uh, judges and administrative uh, uh, policymakers uh, to uh, support those uh, initiatives. So um, these are the two papers that this uh, talk is basically building off and uh, both of them are available on the internet if you want to see them. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No. We can share. We can share. All right. We're gonna we're gonna pick up with um, <clears throat> essentially. Uh, uh, Pam helpfully gave us a broad overview of the, uh, the role of l &E's, limitations and exceptions on intellectual property rights um, as, uh, as sort of a springboard for an enabling. Um, and now we're going to go back a little bit more to the storytelling and to the academic and adv advocate dialogue and focus a little bit more in particular about the, the power and the uh, ability of an open-ended or flexible limitation or exception as an enabling doctrine, and the relationship between what a fair use, fair dealing, open-ended exception allows and what openly licensed works do. Um, and over the time, periodically, there's been some confusion about that as if, uh, you know, the, there has been criticism from our community sometimes about the value of a fair use, that it doesn't get you far enough that you need an open license. And I, I think we've sort of outgrown and, and uh, gotten past that, and, and we we'll talk a, lot, a little bit more about that. So um, I'm delighted to introduce um, our final speakers here. Uh, to my immediate left is Professor Carolyn Mube, um, and she is at the University of Cape Town. She is the DST NRF SAR CHL Research Chair in Intellectual Property Innovation and Development, um, and she holds a PhD from the University of Cape Town and her undergraduate uh, degree is from the University of Zimbabwe and an LLM from the University of Cambridge. Um, and Carolyn's been a longtime friend of our program um, and has done a lot of work uh, and is, is a longtime member of this community. Next to her is Peter Yazi, my uh, distinguished colleague. Uh, we have a distinguished intellectual property lecture named after my distinguished colleague, who recently has taken the title of Professor Emeritus, but that just means that he's not teaching his regular classes anymore. He's still a very active member of our program, as you can see, um, and has been doing a lot of work, as you well know, on fair use, not just in the United States, but in traveling around the world, helping to explain what our experience has been with open-ended limitations and exceptions, why some of the critiques of their enabling powers uh, are not well-founded, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about sort of the international dialogue around the open-ended uh, limitation and exception. Um, one thing I do want to uh, say, just as a, as a framing, is um, there are, at the international level, we know in WIPO, pushes for a library treaty, pushes for an education treaty, um, and many systems have, you know, uh, enumerated limitations and exceptions. But it's important for those advocating for the, the, the more specific limitations and exceptions to please keep in mind uh, 
that there is the negative inference that is the danger. That if you have the closed list, then there cannot be a, an open-ended limitation and exception. In the United States, we had a close call where our library, it was argued that our specific library exemption uh, therefore foreclosed any resort to the open-ended fair use. Um, and, and in this particular case, the argument was because the use did not fit, was done by a library and did not fit within the library exception, it was therefore infringing. And it was only because the legislation had a specific reference to the open-ended limitation and exception and said, we specifically are not overruling fair use, that fair use was able to come in and do the work. And so uh, please, for those of you who are skeptical of the value of the open-ended, even if we can't persuade you that that is a good use of your advocacy uh, time and effort, please at least leave space for the open-ended possibility in your advocacy for specific limitations uh, or else uh, you may get unintended consequences. So with that, I wanna just remind us um, of uh, where Sean sort of started us uh, re referring back to the 2011 Washington Declaration. And I, wanna, I want us to remember that, that we have the, uh, the claim for openness and the claim for uh, more limitations and exceptions are side by side, seen as completely compatible um, and mutually supportive uh, policy goals. And I think we've seen a lot of success on both fronts. So um, in a, we advocated for the public domain, no further copyright exceptions or lim uh, extensions of copyright. We're getting a small invasion of the public domain with our, this music act that is likely to become US law, but uh, we've been able to slow down the momentum on co extending uh, copyright. And we've talked about supporting the use of open educational resources through government procurement policies for textbooks and other educational materials. We've seen a number of policies in a number of jurisdictions, including here in the US, where we've had $5 million uh, at, allocated in two successive years for the production of open textbooks. So we've seen some, we're seeing some nice policy success on the open access front, on the open education resources front. Um, but those of us working in the OER space know that without fair use, we're not gonna be able to get OER in things like English and language arts, where you need third party materials in, incorporated into your OER. So we have very concrete use cases where OER uh, needs fair use and fair use will be benefited by the uh, amplification of the open licensed materials. Uh, and next to that, we had our, our claim to strengthen limitations and exceptions for many of the reasons that Pam outlined. Um, and among those, we wanted to promote discussion of employing open-ended limitations in national copyright legislations in addition to specific exceptions. And it's to that work um, that Peter and Carolyn have been uh, particularly devoting their time and effort. We are seeing success in South Africa. I don't want to jinx it, so I want to say nothing more than the wind is blowing in a positive direction, and I'll ask Carolyn to uh, characterize that. Um, but there have been a number of other places where uh, there's an, a new thinking, um, and a lot of it has to do with technological innovation and the ability of the flexible limitations to, to open up that space. But I'm now gonna ask Carolyn to tell us a little bit about what's going on in South Africa, what's this dialogue around adding fair use, um, and why now? Thanks, Mike. So. Um that's a loaded question, actually, um, and I wonder where to start and, and what to say and what not to say. So um, I'm just going to be picky and start where I like and end where I like, right? Because uh, I have the mic. Great. So um, in, in South Africa, and I, I don't think it would be appropriate to give too much detail, the process uh, is, is in motion. We haven't seen the final version of the bill, so I think the best approach is to speak uh, on a basis of principles and broad strokes, and so that's what I will do. So um, you're quite right that the approach that has been taken or that appears to be um, at the forefront currently is that the draft legislation has a set of specific exceptions and limitations. Uh, many of them are quite progressive, um, quite encouraging. So for example, there are provisions in there that address themselves to Marrakesh and a provision uh, to 
to accessible formats for the visually impaired, but it goes beyond that um, because the definition of disability in the draft legislation is beyond uh, visual impairment. And so that, that's quite encouraging. Um, and there are many other aspects that are included. And then in addition to these specific um, exceptions and limitations, then we do have uh, an open, flexible clause. And by that I mean that there's a clause that uh, permits use of work. It's, it's open to all users, to all works, and for all purposes. And so that's how broad it is. And, and that seems to be the direction in which the wind is blowing. You asked me the question, um, why now? Um, and, and so I, I think that a number of factors uh, bring us to this point. Um, it, it's quite a story. So. Um, we have reached the end of quite a long journey. I think it would be fair to say that copyright law reform has been in the making for at least a decade um, in South Africa. Um, it's reached a crescendo, of course, in the last five or so years um, with the draft IP policy in 2013, the first draft bill in 2015, and then various iterations between then and now. And so what I think is that a perfect storm has been building um, consistently. And earlier on the first panel we had, um, someone spoke about a just cause. I think that a number of just causes have coalesced in South Africa to bring us to the point where we are. So Sean asked the question earlier about the fees must fall movement. Um, and, and this is a, a very progressive, very powerful, very strong, very justified movement for free tertiary education um, in the country. And, and it has garnered a lot of success. And I think the next step now is now that um, tertiary education, free tertiary education is on the books. The next question is, right, there you are. Do you actually have the learning materials that you need? And without preempting um, a documentary or movie that you'll be able to see tomorrow, um, you start to have students in the student movement start to address then um, access to learning materials. And, and so I think that's one just cause that has come up um, in, in the context of South Africa. Um, another just cause that has risen rightfully to the fore um, is the plight of creatives in the country. So when you attend uh, parliamentary public hearings and you start to listen to the stakeholders and what concerns them, one very strong anecdote that comes to the fore all the time is the story of a creative um, who lives poor and dies indigent, right? So, so this is a concern. Uh, Everybody across the divide will say, but why is this happening? And so I think that this once again has built up to this stage where now you can say these suggestions that we're putting across, these normative claims that we're putting across would actually meet this need, would actually address the plight of the poor creative. And so I, I think that the combination of a just course and almost a decade of concerted efforts to provide uh, empirical evidence to policymakers to tell a good story has actually led us to this point in time where we're able to, to make these moves, I think. It's a long-winded answer, but... Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah. You know what, you, you've been to South Africa, and maybe you want to pick up there, but uh, then I, maybe take us... I a do. I want to, I want to recognizing time and that we, we, we stand between you and a party, I want to be brief, but I do want to loop back a little bit before I get to South Africa. Uh, I became... A, copyright activist in the summer of 1994 while lying on my back during an extended illness because a good friend of mine had a very sort of weird idea about appropriate hospital reading and sent along a, a copy of the green paper on intellectual property and the national information infrastructure, which she thought would be just the thing for me. And it, it was, in a sense, it, 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 sort of, it sort of roused me from my torpor because it was such a horrible document. And soon afterwards, I found myself, with a, after a sort of very strategic shove from Pam Samuelson and a big hand up from the American library community, without any particular, I mean, without any background in organizing trying to put together uh, a resistance movement against what became the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and which and had in its original provisions uh, a number of features that were very, very threatening to the fair use doctrine as it then stood in the United States as an 
an achieved part of our law. And I learned a lot of things from that experience. And although we had many failures, we did manage, among other things, to save fair use in its present form, which is not, not, a, not a bad thing to have accomplished. And the main thing I learned was the power of solidarity. The power of solidarity as a, a motive of activism, the power of solidarity both to effective resistance and even to constructive action. And what we did then and what I've always uh, advocated for since is to build a very, very broad-based coalition of interest groups within the civil society, academic, non-academic, business, non-business, religion, and religious and secular. And it, it was, in the end, uh, a voice, because it was, a, at least for a while, a very, a very strong and, and, and well-coordinated voice, which policymakers simply couldn't ignore, or at least couldn't ignore completely, which is, after all, more or less what you might want in such a situation. So I've been to South Africa a, a, a number of times on both copyright and non-copyright related business, and what I want to say, echoing everything that, that, that Carolyn has said now, is that an extraordinary thing is taking place in South Africa today. South Africa is on track to enact a modern copyright law with robust, flexible, open exceptions facing toward education, facing toward culture, and facing toward innovation, which is also important, and including, incidentally, a provision that answers the question that Pam raised earlier about the problem of contractual preemption of statutory limitations and exceptions. It's an absolutely extraordinary accomplishment. We don't want to jinx it. We don't want to, we don't want to talk about it as, a, as, a, as an accomplished fact because it isn't yet. But what it is, is the result of an extraordinary coming together within civil society and an extraordinary collaboration between academics from throughout the, the South African academic establishment, but particularly at, at UCT, and librarians, the redoubtable Denise Nicholson, among others, filmmakers, tech innovators, it goes on and on and on. And it is a model, I think, of how even under very adverse circumstances and even with strong counter pressure from industry, domestic and global, it is still possible for a broad-based social society movement to succeed. There are other copyright struggles in the world, other places where the, the possibility of installing broad, functional, flexible copyright limitations is, is within reach in Australia, for example. And again, if that is eventually accomplished, it will be because of the breadth and the strength and the continuity of the civil society coalition that has come together. So I, get my, I guess my message for all of you at, at the end of this remarkable day is don't despair. Uh, it, it, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, there are many defeats that, that precede success. But if, if I had one message to take away and one thing to note and, and, and praise about the South African effort, one effort, one thing to take away from my own experience, and one thing to praise about the South African effort, it would be that point about the essential importance of broad-based civil society engagement, the power of coalitions that I think we're, we're all in our, in our own places and in our own ways capable of mobilizing as we did in a small way once here and as is being done in a, a 
big way in South Africa. Great. And Carolyn, can, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, one other question, and then we'll invite questions from the floor. But um, you know, one of the things when you, we advocate about the benefits of the open-ended limitations and exceptions, um, sometimes we're using the language of users' rights. And my understanding is that that vocabulary, which works very well in some places, the Supreme Court of Canada has, has embraced it and really uh, made it very useful for those of us attracted to that formulation to have a basis in, in on the books. But my understanding is it didn't it didn't go over in it wasn't received in the way that some of us thought it might be in that policy debate. And maybe help us understand why and and what 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 was more effective or has been more effective to date? Um, I think what clearly emerged is that um, taking the tack of user rights um, seemed to be too one-sided. Um, it seemed not to accord with the just causes, for example, of your uh, struggling creative, right? Because um, in, in the popular imagination, your creative is not a user, he's on the other end of the spectrum. And, and so uh, there needed to be a readjustment of, of the narrative um, to, to focus perhaps more on, on creators rather than users, and also to convince um, you know, society at large and policymakers that in fact, um, all users are creators and vice versa, right? And so if, if that is the, the narrative that you want to push, perhaps you don't want to latch onto a phrase that seems to, um, to, to uh, generate some concerns. And so I think that in our context, we then moved away from emphasis on user rights and started to be more inclusive and pay particular attention to the just cause of the struggling creative. And I think that has worked particularly well. Anyone? I know you're thirsty, but you got to ask a question. You can't have a drink until you ask a question. Um, others who are in in the struggle and want to um, here. I'm gonna. Do we have a mic or we have a mic? All right. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the relationship between, um, on the one hand, the limitations and exceptions conversation, and the second uh, part is with um, efforts to make the production of knowledge as a public good? The, can you, production of knowledge as a public good, production by whom? Well, um, uh, uh, for, for example, in science, for example, the, the, the National Science Foundation, some of the research that they fund just enters the public domain as a public good. Uh, it doesn't depend upon uh, the idea that you uh, close it with intellectual property and commercialize it as the incentive for investors to do it. The, the government just sort of funds it up front. or. Um, uh, uh, free software is developed as a public good, essentially. Um, it's uh, in whatever business models that are put forward. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the <coughs> in some cases, there's a, there's a more elegant funding model uh, th than others, but there are these sort of business models where y you don't even really have to go to the idea of limitations and exceptions. That the, the people that are creating the, the, the knowledge good are putting out there for free access in, in various ways. And that's sort of a, a different paradigm than the idea that you start with the idea that the knowledge is sort of protected and you sort of work back on the exceptions. I mean, I, I think they're both important, but I just I just wanted to sort of, the people out there that are working on these issues of limitation exceptions, I know that some of you do both. I know that, Michael, that you do in terms of open education resources, for example. They're right. Sort of, Okay, so I got it. So I think this is important that, that it's, your advocacy needs to be, you know, if you're trying to change people's behavior or create a structure in which you're promoting productive behavior that you imagine it's realistic to pre, um, uh, promote, I, this is the point about why the openness movement and the 
uh, the push for flexible limitations and exceptions have to work hand in hand because they're, they're working in different contexts. So when public funding is available, then our author incentive story about copyright immediately has to be uh, called into question because our, our whole story was that you're going to go into a private market and get rewarded for your effort in a private market. The story has to be different if the government has just given you the money to do that. So advocates around open licensing for public sector information and publicly funded research, publicly funded educational goods have to push that argument that this standard copyright story is premised on private investment that needs some kind of reward. If that's not, a, if that's not the fact, then we really ought to be looking at either a public domain de dedication or a broad open license as, as the response in order to make sure that the investment, the public investment, is in fact realized. And I think this is where the open access movement, we're at a really exciting point where we've been slowly working with government just saying, okay, we'll keep the subscription business model around journals completely viable. There's no threat to that business model if we wait six months or a year before anybody has access and they have read-only access. But we've seen slow, uh, I made this a part of my talk. So we have a hero in the Gates Foundation, Dick Wilder, worked within that organization to say that's such a half measure. If we're gonna invest all of our money in creating millions and millions of dollars worth of research, that then's gonna get sort of, we're having the little tail of the published article wag the dog this is, this is wrong. We want maximum impact for our research, uh, and therefore we want open access immediately under an open license. Um, and the Gates Foundation adopted a policy and told all of their grantees who are top tier researchers who are accustomed to publishing in top tier journals, you have two years to figure this out, but at, at the end of two years, your research is gonna be published under a, a Creative Commons attribution license or don't take our money. Um, and People said, oh, well, the journals won't publish that. You're, you know, you're, you're gonna lose your researchers. Yeah. You're gonna turn down Gates funding for your malarial research? No, it doesn't happen, right? Um, and so, and, and now we have something called Plan S. Because Gates said, we're done with half measures. We're gonna do real open access. We're gonna get real return on investment. Plan S is now a group of European science funders who said, yeah, we agree with the Gates. We're done with the half measures. We're done with the six month embargo uh, on this important uh, scientific knowledge. Again, giving you advance notice, adjust your ducks, get them in order because soon enough, we want everything published under an open access license on day one. Um, and this is the way progress happens. It's, it's this building on and so I think We've had good policy su success there because the public funding changes the narrative. But we need the open-ended uh, limitations and exceptions as the baseline for all of the other works that are being created in the private market. If I could just add, there's another, uh, maybe a variant on that answer, which is something that, that um, we, we already heard about a little bit earlier, but I want to reemphasize, and that is that some um, open resources, some things that are created with the intention of sharing and without the intention of ongoing gain from licensing or otherwise, things like open educational resources require effective limitations and exceptions in order to be created in the first instance, unless you love history books without pictures um, or science books without charts. So there is a much sort of less, less um, theoretical but more practical engagement between these systems. Some open resources require copyright exceptions to enter into existence in the first instance. Okay, I saw hands coming up. Luis, Teresa. Thank you. Uh, I will make an out of the box question. No, I I have the feeling that you know sometimes you know our discourse for getting global exceptions 
doesn't get tracked because in many countries there is, you know, already an exception because people do not comply with the law. So, so, so then because there are different levels, you know, of uh, engagement of uh, the society with, with this concept, then there is a different need for a solution because there is, the problem doesn't exist. So, but my question is, should this movement it also be concerned with the issue of fair remuneration for commercial, you know, authors. You know, no, I'm not talking about you know a guy taking a picture you know, to the family, but someone who who is a professional artist or a professional, you know, author. It, at least from what you know, I, I got to have the, the idea is that they are not really being fair remunerated because they are a mandatory transfer of right or whatever thing. So. But my, my question would be, should we, I mean, because we are on, on this because we want justice. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, exception for exception. So the question is, should we as a movement also be concerned with the issue of fair remuneration as a way to advance our exceptions agenda, which you all know that I'm, you know, a, a, a believer, right? So, Luis, definitely yes. Um, if we want to be an effective and trusted and reliable uh, movement, I think that uh, we then would pursue justice and justice for all. And, and so I would definitely say that the answer to that is yes. And um, if we take that broad and approach, that, that um, considerate approach, I think then the arguments that we make and the normative claims that we make actually have more traction than to appear one-sided. Teresa? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much for the great, great panels. Um, so I just have one brief comment and one question. Um, so Mike, on, or Michael, on your, your comment on the issue of flexible exceptions versus uh, open-ended exceptions versus a specific list of exceptions, we hear you and we understand and we appreciate entirely the, the benefit of an open-ended exception. And for us, the, you know, having a, a specific list of library exceptions does not preclude an open-ended exception. So we're I think we're, we're, we're on the same page on that. Um, so my, my question is, is related to the, um, the, the stories that we heard from the, the, the experience of the South African reforms and the, the, the winds that are blowing, uh, winds of change that are blowing in that direction, which are, are, are positive by all accounts. Um, you, you mentioned that the, it, it, it's the process it's re reached a crescendo after maybe 10 years and maybe even longer. Um, you've, there's been visits to South Africa um, at various stages and there's been congressional hearings or parliamentary hearings and there's been a lot of dedication, hard work and effort by a lot of individuals and organizations in making this process happen. So my question really is like, at an international level or, or at a level of, of other countries, uh, for all countries around the world, how sustainable is that? Uh, such a long, uh, you know, a campaign that takes time and effort and a lot of resources to make that happen. And what we can see with the example of the Marrakesh Treaty, for example, uh, how, how that has really pushed reforms at the national level. So around nine of 12 countries that we are working with at the moment that are amending their copyright laws at the moment are, are doing that specifically as a result of the Marrakesh Treaty. So we can see that the Marrakesh Treaty has had a great effect on um, encouraging reforms at national level. And what it's also done is that those reforms are happening a lot faster than the other reforms that are happening you know, in, in independently at the national level. So I, got, I guess my question is like in, in terms of the, the efforts, from what I can see from a, an activist standpoint at least, that having an international treaty has really been a game changer in, in, um, in supporting national copyright law reforms. Thank you. So um, I, I, and, um, I agree, right, that if you have changes being powered by um, international developments such as a treaty, that the, the national reforms come much quicker. Um, and South Africa's uh, developments have not been powered by such on all fronts. For some years, of course, Marrakesh, for example. And so how sustainable would that be? How workable a model would the South African process be for other countries? 
I think that um, the answer is that not many other countries or, or coalitions in those countries would be able to sustain uh, a campaign you know, that long. But what I think the benefit of the length um, of the South African campaign is that then it can serve as a model. So yesterday I went to a, a panel that uh, where uh, a report, an open science report in India was being launched. And one of the most heartening comments that I heard from that is that they had taken inspiration from what is happening in South Africa and were being powered by that. So I think that the length of time that it has taken in, in one country um, surely is going to shorten the length of time it takes in others, particularly if that first country becomes a good model and then other countries can follow on it. So I, I think... That's where I would leave it, yeah. I, I agree um, tremendously. I think that already we have seen interest in this era, in this sparked by developments in countries like South Africa, excuse me, countries like South Korea and, and, and Israel. I think if, if South Africa is able to pull this off, it is going to be an enormous example to the rest of the world and an incredible source of encouragement for domestic advocates. So I, not to raise the stakes, not to suggest <laughs> that this is even more important than one might imagine, but although it's obviously true that that international agreements on are, are, are powerful, especially if the provisions they contain are mandatory rather than permissive, um, those agreements are also very hard to achieve. As, as someone who who was a, around for m much of the Marrakesh history, that was it's a long story. Um, it took a great deal of time, despite the fact that the cause was so clearly worthy and attractive. So we need to do both. We need to work at both levels, and the two the two kind of efforts need to need to reinforce one another, as I, I think they, they will continue to do. You had going once, going twice, <laughs> sold. Uh, can we please <laughs> thank Peter and Carolyn. Refreshments are outside. You've earned them. Um, and it's, I think, is, the, is am I right? The sun is out? Is that, yeah. we've been in a window, windowless room all day, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, and by the way, we have movie movies tonight and uh, tomorrow. So if anyone is uh, would like to see the movie Paywall about the open access movement, it will be screened in the Weinstein, in, at eight o'clock in the Weinstein ceremonial courtroom, which is a little bit hard to get to, but what you do is you sort of uh, walk down this corridor, go up into the atrium, take the stair, the main staircase up to the first floor, and it's the old chapel. So it's a beautiful room. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Uh, and Paywall will be screened again tomorrow along with a number of other movies. Are there any other logistics I missed? Uh,